Hello and welcome to another Tri Tutors video. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the poem The Child Who Was Shot Dead by Soldiers in the Younger by Ingrid Yoker. Some background on the poem. This is a South African poem that is set during the apartheid era. It was originally written in Afrikaans and it has been translated into English. It is a protest poem, so the genre of the poem is a protest poem, because it was written in response to the Sharpeville Massacre of 1960. The background for this poem is particularly important, so be aware of the South African context with regard to apartheid and to past laws before reading this poem. Our poet is Ingrid Jonker. She lived between 1933 and 1965. She was affiliated with a group of anti-establishment writers. They were writing against the conventions of the time. She was condemned by her father, who was a National Party member of Parliament. She lived a troubled life and she died by suicide at the age of 31. Nelson Mandela actually read one of her poems in his inaugural State of the Nation address in 1994. So let's have a look at the title. So this is obviously my interpretation of the poem. You can have different interpretations. The important thing with poetry is if you have an interpretation of what the word means or what the connotations are of a particular sentence, um, then it's just important to back up your interpretation with the evidence. So I'm going to try and show you how I've analyzed it and how there is evidence um, for my interpretation. So I also have a lot of differing interpretations as I read it through. I was like, this can be read in this way or it can be read in that way or the other way. Um, so consider those different alternatives and figure out which one you can prove um, in a more structured answer in a more cohesive way. So if we look at the title, the child who was shot dead by soldiers in Younger, so the is a definite article um, and that can indicate the significance of this particular child because this child is going to be a symbol, it's going to be a metaphor, it's going to be an inspiring force. Child is significant because of the connotations, the word child has connotations of innocent, harmless, playful, naive, ignorant, who was shot dead this shows us how fatal this shooting was by soldiers. If we look at soldiers, firstly it's plural, which um, is important because we have a singular child who has been shot dead by many soldiers. And if we think about the connotations of child and then we think about the connotations of soldiers and the fact that they're plural, this makes the crime all the more problematic and upsetting and horrific. So what are the connotations of soldiers? Soldiers are trained fighters, they stop evil forces, which also it raises the question, why are this, this soldier and the child even interacting? Why is there this fatal event? Because a child cannot be evil, right? A child cannot actually do something so wrong that soldiers would warrant this sort of behavior. In the younger, this is going to give us um, in setting, a hint at the setting, Nyanga is a township in the Western Cape and so we can understand that this is a poem about the apartheid era and about the horrific events that happened in the townships. The title is quite interesting as well because it seems like a statement of fact, there's a sort of lack of emotion. Yes, we are analysing the connotations of the words but there's no sort of big adjectives in there or, um, you know, emotive language. Um, and so it's quite an interesting thing to think about, perhaps as pointing to the frequency of this event taking place under the apartheid regime. Um, and so it's almost like there's this desensitization to it, which is incredibly concerning and worrying and sad and upsetting. Moving on to stanza one. Stanza one. The child is not dead. The child raises his fists against his mother, who screams Africa, screams the smell of freedom and heather, in the locations of the heart under siege. So the first line over there, the child is not dead. This is an immediate contradiction of the title. So it's quite shocking because we've come to realize from the title that the child is dead. And now we have a complete contradiction that now the child is not dead. And so this is we're gonna discuss later on in terms of the child being physically dead, but spiritually being this force of inspiration. Um, so that immediate contradiction immediately draws us into the poem. 
Also notice that the child and the child on the first and second line is repeated. This is called anaphora. Anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines. And this anaphora in particular emphasizes the importance of the child and how the child is the root of the future struggle. It's also can be seen as a you know a mourning cry of pain or a spirited cry of resistance often repetition is a feature of that the child raises his fists against his mother so here we have this lifting of the fists in a defiant manner if we think about the connotations of fists it's about fighting it's about anger it's about resistance we're going to come back to why he's raising his fist against his mother in the next stanza and we will chat about it together with that line where he raises his fist against his father who screams Africa, screams the smell of freedom and heather. So notice over here um, the repetition, which is going to be repeated later on as well. So the use of screams and the repetition of screams emphasizes the anguish which permeates South Africa, emphasizes the anguish of the protest and of how um, the anti-resistant, oh, sorry, the anti-apartheid resistors um, are desperate for freedom and um, are fighting intensely for it. Um, and are experiencing pain and sacrifice as a result of the struggle. The use of Africa is also significant, you know, not just South Africa, um, and it invokes the struggle of the entire continent. This is a poem written in the 1960s, and so if you're familiar with African history in the 1960s, this will make a lot of sense as well. So it, it invokes the struggle of the entire continent. Screams the smell. So this use of smell is really significant whenever we have the use of the senses and makes the situation more real, immersive and resonant for the actual reader. Also the phrase, you know, the smell of freedom um, is quite a common expression and it sort of implies that freedom is imminent, that freedom is coming. Notice the enjambment here and we're going to discuss this more towards the end of the video when we talk about the structure of the poem. But here it's very noticeable, smell of freedom and heather. So notice the lack of punctuation, notice the run on lines. Heather, some versions even use felt because heather is felt, the South African landscape once again giving us context and setting. In the locations of the heart and the siege. So notice um, that we have location is plural, locations, and this indicates that many places feel the oppression um, of the apartheid regime. So it's not just one location, it's not just in Nyanga. This um, event has um, opened up wounds perhaps in many other places because so many places have been struggling under siege. So under siege means, um, you know, when an army or when a city is under siege, it means the opposing army has surrounded them. So there's no access to the outside world. So this military strategy is effective because um, the people inside will eventually run out of food and water and supplies and things like that. So under siege in this case means oppressed, restricted and cut off. And so if you think about um, what the apartheid government tried to do to African people, um, this really matches up. They try to restrict them and oppress them. Um, notice the use of heart, so the locations of the heart under siege. This is an example of synecdoche. So synecdoche is when a part represents a whole or a whole represents a part. And so in this case, um, using the heart, we know that it's not just the heart that's being oppressed, right? We know it's actually the entire being, the entire person that's being oppressed. Um, but the use of heart emphasizes the emotion that is felt as a result of this, uh, as a result of this oppression. Moving on to stanza two. The child raises his fists against his father in the march of the generations who scream Africa, scream the smell of justice and blood in the streets of his armed pride. So the child over here, we're seeing that this is a, the child is a symbol. It is a metaphor for the spirit of freedom. Raises his fists against his father. Notice the alliteration, fists father. This emphasizes the fighting spirit. So I said I was going to talk about raising his fists against his mother and father together. So there are a couple of interpretations that I think could work over here. Um, and you can obviously select the one that you find to be the most convincing. So, and also what your teacher has, has mentioned to you. So firstly, if we think of mother and father are typically figures associated with the protection and care of a child, as it is their duty to 
look out and to shield, um, to shield and look out for their children. The fact that the child resists them can show how the being who is responsible for caring for its people, which is the country of South Africa, is actually the force oppressing them. It is a somewhat unnatural image. So that interpretation, you can see it as the child being representative, representative of the people oppressed under the apartheid government, and they are resisting their own country, which is supposed to protect them. Just like a mother and father are supposed to protect the child, in this case, South Africa is not actually protecting its own people and they have to resist. Another interpretation, this could also refer to the change in anti-apartheid resistance strategy. The child, who perhaps represents the youth, is changing the way the struggle will proceed. And so this makes sense in context because the Sharpeville massacre occurred in 1960. The Sharpeville massacre was started off as a peaceful protest against past laws and ended in extreme violence with many people um, being killed by police forces and many people injured as well. And in 1961, the armed wing of the ANC, MK, was launched. And this marked a distinct change in terms of how the anti-apartheid struggle was going to unfold because beforehand it was more non-violent resistance and now there was a more aggressive approach. And so the child raising his fist against his mother and father can be representative of how the strategy towards a party resistance is changing and it's going to become more aggressive than previous generations or perhaps it could be as um you know parents mourn the death of a child and this child is saying don't just mourn me don't just cry or rather fight against what killed me rather fight against these evil forces so different interpretation is there take with that what you use with that what you will in the march of the generations so this is also one that you can understand in different ways um so it can be linked to this mother and father thing that we spoke about that there is a difference in the generations in terms of how they're fighting but also i think it could refer to that all different people are uniting to resist because if you think about the shop for massacre that was men women and children being shot at the police um, we're shooting at everyone and so it's the march of the generations this affects so many people and they all are uniting to resist who scream Africa scream the smell of justice and blood notice the repetition um, think about blood and blood can symbolize anger and pain and it can also symbolize a sacrifice and so this can signify the many sacrifices and the horrific consequences that were endured as a result of resisting the apartheid regime in the streets of his armed pride so this is um, a really interesting line um, so if we think about it um, i think it makes the most sense to the armed pride being the anti-apartheid fighters because it's talking about the child so it's in his armed pride um, so these are the anti-apartheid fighters who are armed. What are they armed with? A fighting and determined spirit. As a result of this child's death, it's haunting them and it's motivating them to fight against apartheid. And pride, they have this intense belief in their cause. And if you think about um, the word pride, you can think about the collective noun for lions, right? A pride of lions. And so this is incredibly effective because um, if you think about lions, lions are powerful, they're, you know, confident. Um, so you're comparing, you're having this sort of, um, how would you say it? Um, it's not a direct comparison, but the use of this word is really clever because they have a pride, they have a belief in their cause, but you can also understand the strength of that word that em emulates the strength of the anti-apartheid fighters. Stanza three. The child is not dead, neither at Langa nor at Nyanga, nor at Orlando nor at Sharpeville, nor at the police station in Philippi, where he lies with a bullet in his head. Notice all the negatives in this stanza. We have not, neither, nor, 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 nor. And this is really significant um, because it links to the listing of the townships. So we have a whole list of different townships here where all atrocities transpired. Um, and this list of townships where innocent children were killed and where the black where black pride and the African spirit was oppressed um, This is 
the what, oh sorry the reason why it's listed like this um, is it's to emphasize how the apartheid regime tried to extend tried extensively to subjugate Africans to oppression but also the repetition of all these different no's and nor's and even the listing of the townships can emphasize that Africans rose up countless times to resist. It's an idea that the spirit of freedom cannot be suppressed. And if you think about what a township symbolizes, um, a township is was in, created and it was intended to isolate Africans and to crush the African spirit. And so by having all these negatives and showing that what the intention of the townships actually um, has been overruled and that the anti-apartheid resistors have come on top of that and they have resisted that and they have not stood for that. Um, the child is not dead, that first line, repetition, once again for emphasis. And this is really going to bring up this idea of physical death and sort of spiritual death. So the child is physically dead and that is reinforced with the last line of the stanza that he has a bullet in his head. But he lives on in the spiritual sense. He is inspiring the fight for justice. Um, if you notice the mention of sharp bull, this is an allusion. So this is a sort of technical term that we can use, an allusion, which is a reference to the sharp bull massacre of 1960. And if we look at the last line, the last line can be seen or can be classified as a paradox because it is a contrast with the first line of the stanza. You've literally said the child is not dead and then it says he's lying with a bullet in his head. And this is an incredibly brutal description, um, but it emphasizes that the child is maybe physically dead, but his spirit will live on. The desire or spirit for freedom cannot be killed by bullets. It is something that is so strong um, and so you know, it's never going to actually die until it, freedom is realized. Stanza four. The child is the shadow of the soldiers on guard with guns, sarakens and batons. The child is present at all meetings and legislations. The child peeps through the windows of houses and into the hearts of mothers. The child who just wanted to play in the sun at the younger is everywhere. The child who became a man treks through all of Africa. The child who became a giant travels through the whole world. So a really impactful stanza over here. The child is the shadow of the soldiers. This is a metaphor. It's a direct comparison. Um, and I think you can see this in different ways. So firstly, you can see it perhaps as the child has become a soldier in terms of he will fight violently for a cause and he is inspiring this fight. The shadow could also show how the soldier is perhaps haunted by the killing of the innocent child or this sort of shadow hangs over the apartheid government. It's like they have the capacity or they have been killing children um, and that's definitely a shadow, a dark um, presence in their life or um, in, the, in the legacy. On guard with guns, sarakens and batons. So these are all um, objects associated with apartheid guns obviously then armored cars or tanks and if you think about those terrible images of um of the apartheid regime the armored cars and tanks were there to protect the soldier they were not to protect the child um it seemed like the apartheid regime were preparing to fight terrorists with trained armies and military forces but it was actually peaceful protesters and in this case it was a child so all listing of all these different weapons really indicates um, the horrific nature of this of this crime the child is present at all meetings and legislations so um, this is quite interesting because it's not specific in terms of is this the meetings of the resistance movement, is this apartheid government meetings. I think in terms of shadow, perhaps it could indicate this child's shadow hangs over any sort of legislation that the apartheid government is passing, but also that this child's memory informs the resistance meetings, resistance meetings, and um, the child's legacy has um, inspired the resistors to, um, you know, to take up the um to take up forces to fight the brutality that they are up against to engage in serious war it's almost like the child um, has inspired this resistance moving on to the last four lines of this stanza you'll notice the anaphora once again 
Um, the child and what he represents has an abundance of influence and permeates every individual and aspect of life and destiny. So this is really emphatic. The child peeps through the windows of houses and into the hearts of mothers. The child never dies, he never goes away. He's peeping, he's looking, he is inspiring. Um, if you think about a window and what a window can represent, a window is once again that spirit of resistance. This child or the anti-apartheid movement, or the child as an embodiment of the anti-apartheid movement keeps finding opportunity to grow, thrive and conquer um, and involve every person in this struggle and into the hearts of mothers. So this repetition of heart, and if you think about heart, it's on such a deep level. Um, so what the child represents is featured on such a deep level, it cannot be let go. It's the spirit of resistance, it's within people's hearts. It cannot, it's not something that can be oppressed or taken away without a fight. The child who just wanted to play in the sun and the younger is everywhere. I think that is maybe the um, most poignant line of this of this poem because um, you know it's really quite it makes the crime all the more upsetting that his only crime in inverted commas is wanting to just play in the sun so it's such a innocent thing that he wanted to do all he wanted was to play and um, this really em emphasizes how the protesters are not fighting for privileges or not fighting for anything bizarre they are fighting for basic rights it's just about actually for kids being able to play in the sun the child who became a man treks through all of africa so the child unfortunately was not able to become a man in the physical sense right he wasn't able to grow up he was killed but what he represents has transformed and developed and grown if you think about um the word treks and the connotations of treks it's a struggle you know if you trek up a mountain it's it's something that you struggle through right it's not like you're taking a leisurely walk but treks represents this persistence and this perseverance through all of africa once again alluding to the struggles of the entire continent and to the united spirit of africans under oppression and this fight against that oppression his spirit has also grown to inspire the entire continent and in the next line has grown to inspire the entire world. Um, the child who became a giant travels through the whole world. So obviously this is figurative, it's not literally, he doesn't literally become a giant, figuratively he does. And he travels throughout the world, he navigates to change the world, to beat the oppression around the world, to inspire the world to resist apartheid and to inspire the world to keep fighting for what's right so it even goes above and beyond um you know just having resistance within south africa this child is inspiring and this horrific event inspires the entire world to view apartheid differently and um to you know um to put measures in place to fight against this oppressive system and to fight for what is right and then the last stanza which is, maybe I take it back, this is also a really um, poignant line. And it makes up the entire stanza, which really emphasizes the importance of it and emphasizes its irony without a pass. So one line stand is isolated, it emphasizes the line and it emphasizes the non-conformity to restriction and oppression. The irony is evident. The protesters and the protest itself is unbounded and unlimited by apartheid measures. It inspires and roams free. The spirit of resistance is unyielding, defiant and strong. The Sharpeville massacre was about past laws and this event inspired the poem. And so the fact that it ends with the spirit of resistance and freedom and this child's legacy can roam free without a pass is very significant. And it's ironic because as much as the apartheid government tried to curtail freedom and try to limit and isolate African people, actually there is the spirit of freedom and spirit of resistance that can never be bounded, can never be limited. So we spoke about the structure and notice over here we have no punctuation even at the end of this poem. And throughout the poem we have enjambment, there's limited punctuation, actually there's no punctuation really. 
and this is effective because this is an unresolved issue that continues to haunt South Africa. So there's no sense of closure. There's no full stop. Okay, now you know. Now there's been success, and yes, there's been success. But this um, this legacy of the child's death continues to haunt South Africa and continues to be, be an unresolved issue. So let's analyze some key features of the poem as a whole. In terms of the structure, it's a free verse poem. The rhythm of the poem reinforces the heightened spirit of protest and anger. The enjambment represents the momentum of the struggle against apartheid is uncontrollable. It cannot be stopped and it mimics the freedom the, fe the people are fighting for. There is the sense of freedom and um, unconventional um, lack of restriction that is present in the writing, which emulates and mimics the freedom that the people that the anti-apartheid resistors are fighting for. They don't want to be contained and bound and limited by these measures. There's no punctuation, once again, going against convention. This movement will not be contained or stopped. This is an issue, or this is the spirit of freedom will just continue to thrive and move. Also notice the refrain of the child at the start of each stanza. This emphasizes how the child and the memory of the child are integral and central to the resistance movement. The tone of the poem, I've got quite a few words here. Remember tone is the attitude of the writer or the poet or the speaker. And so we always have to use an adjective. It's passionate, determined, inspired, confident, reflective, contemplative, hopeful, optimistic. At times it can be forceful as well. The mood of the poem is hopeful, in awe, inspiring or inspired, even nationalistic. The themes, um, violence, oppression, brutality, resistance, strength, and the imagery reinforces all these themes. The purpose or the message of the poem is to showcase the strength of the anti-apartheid movement, to show how brutal apartheid was, to indicate the enduring violence on the spirit of freedom of resistance, and ultimately to show us that brutality and violence results in the opposite of subjugation, and ultimately this poem condemns the apartheid regime. I hope that you found that video helpful. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to another Try Cheaters video. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing Sonnet 130 by William Shakespeare. Our poet is William Shakespeare. He lived between 1564 and 1616. He is one of the most famous poets and playwrights. He wrote 154 sonnets and he is known as the Bard. So just a quick background on what a sonnet is. So we have two different types of sonnets. This sonnet is an English or Shakespearean sonnet. It is comprised of 14 lines and it has it's split into three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. So three quatrains meaning um, three different sections, lines of four each and then a rhyming couplet at the end, two lines that match. This is a part of the structure which I'll discuss at the end of the video, but it's important just going ahead into the explanation and into the analysis to have a basic understanding of what the sonnet is. So let's begin with the first quatrain. So, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Carl is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. So before we actually even analyze this first quatrain, let's figure out what this poem is all about. Because it seems, as we read the first quatrain, it seems to be quite different from what we'd expect from a sonnet. A sonnet is typically a poem that details some sort of loving relationship. It's usually some sort of ode or praise of a lover. And here we are seeing this is sort of the complete opposite. So we can understand this poem um, in two ways, fundamentally. So one way we can understand this is that the, his mistress or his beloved is not conventionally beautiful. And so he's going to detail how she is not conventionally attractive. But then at the final two lines in the rhyming couplet, he's going to say that he still loves her. And it's not really about her looks, it's more about her personality. But on a deeper level, this poem actually seeks to critique and mock other love poems for their hyperbolic metaphors and cliches that do not accurately represent women. 
So in this poem, you will see um, the sort of crazy similes and metaphors that other poets use to describe their beloveds. And Shakespeare here is saying that is bizarre and that is inaccurate. Um, and so he is criticizing that. So we can understand it in two different strands. So I think now it makes a lot more sense and he's not just going on this whole critical rant, um, which it seems like the first three quatrains, it's like, oh my God, what is he saying? It's such a terrible poem um, because he's in basically insulting his lover. But then at the rhyming cupboard, we'll see the twists and we'll see how he's actually critiquing and sort of mocking this idea that women are have to be a certain way or um, are conventionally beautiful and are sort of godly instead of earthly so the first line my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun so notice throughout this um, quatrain the speaker details features of the beloved that is usually that are usually praised by other poets so, uh, other poets so other poets would praise each feature of the lover and so shakespeare mimics that he uses nothing which is a really strong word and in the second line he uses far so he's using the extreme for emphasis to show that his lover is absolutely not indicative of these cliches my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun so here we have a simile a comparison to the sun if we think about what the sun represents the sun symbolizes something bright warm powerful that's even life-giving and so shakespeare here res or the speaker we rather say the speaker when we speak about the poem um, resists cliched metaphors and argues that his beloved is far from godly she is earthbound and human and through doing this he elucidates he clarifies how bizarre and untrue or inaccurate these cliches truly are so he says his mistress's eyes are not like the sun at all. Carl is far more red than her lips red. So once again, we discuss using that extreme. Notice the repetition of red to really emphasize how they are definitely not red at all. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dun? Dun is a dull gray brown color. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Um, and so you can see that this is a bit of hyperbole, black wires grow on her head, that's not entirely accurate, that is a bit of a figurative language. Notice the emphasis on colour in these lines, he utilises the different senses in the poem so that the reader is fully immersed in you know, what he's trying to say. Moving on to stanza, well not stanza two, quatrain two. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. So the first line, I have seen roses damask, that means decorated or patterned with red and white. And we know you can have red roses, white roses, but also combined, they are pink. And that's typically how a cliched love poem would describe their lover's cheeks as being, you know, rosy and pink. And so he says he's seen roses that are, you know, red, white, pink, but no such rose I see in her cheeks. So he invokes a classic image of love with the use of roses. Um, and he also uses the color of the roses to show that her cheeks do not resemble that. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Notice the enjambment for these lines. So enjambment, the run on lines, the one sentence or the one line is continuing to the next because it's one point being made over here. Um, and so he says that, you know, there's sometimes um, in love poems, there's this hyperbolic language that is used that sort of makes the, the lover seem godly. And he goes, no, she's not. Her breath actually really stinks. She is human. She is not a goddess in any way. The word reeks is quite hyperbolic, though, because it's, you know, it's the connotations of reeks are quite severe. So he says, no, her breath does not smell like perfume. It actually smells more earthly, more you know, realistic, it actually doesn't smell very good at all. The third quatrain. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. So this I love, I think is a little hint to the final couplet where we're going to see he actually still really loves his mistress. Um, and so that's a little hint for what's coming in the big twist. And so he says, I love to hear her speak, but 
I know that music sounds better. So he's saying her voice is not musical. It's, you know, he, he loves to um, speak with her, but it's not musical or it's not godly. And he says, he admits, I never, I grant I never saw a goddess go. I admit I haven't seen a goddess move, but he's implying here, but if I think about how a goddess would move, she would glide, she wouldn't tread on the ground, she wouldn't actually walk, right? She would be sort of this airy figure gliding. He says, but my mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. But his lover, when she walks, she treads on the ground. And if you think of the connotations of treads, it's make a mark, it's to deliberately step. She is earthly, so this reference to the ground shows that she is earthly, she makes a sound as she moves. So she's not this cliched figure that people or that poets have come up with in the past. She is a real person. And now we get to the twist, we get to the rhyming couplet. And yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare, as any she belied with false compare. And so here we have yet, and this is the change of tonal message. Some versions even have an indent for these two lines to show that this is the twist. And so um, he says here, I think my beloved is as special as any woman who poets have lied about with false comparisons. Um, so we can understand in that regard, or we can understand it as even though she does not fit in with the societal stance of beauty and love, the speaker loves her dearly and their love is special and true. So we can understand that as much as she does not conform or does not actually emulate any of these um, metaphors and comparisons that um, love, poet, love poets have or poets have claimed to feel about their lovers, their love is true. And ultimately he's saying that all those cliched metaphors are perhaps false. So in terms of the structure, as we said, this is an English or Shakespearean sonnet. And remember, sonnets are usually about praising the beloved, and this is subverted in this poem. 14 lines, three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. So the three quatrains outline and develop the arguments in inverted commas. They outline the poet's or the speaker's way of thinking. And then the rhyming couplet concludes everything, and it also summarizes and provides a twist, perhaps. The rhyme scheme. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So G, G is that rhyming couplet. And it is written in iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter mirrors everyday speech patterns. Um, and it's when you have 10 syllables on a line and it is five stressed syllables, five unstressed. You start with the unstressed syllable and then you alternate between the stressed and the unstressed. The tone of the poem is assertive, reflective, sincere, candid, at times, with certain elements, it's sarcastic, ironic, or mocking. The mood is somewhat humorous and reflective. The theme and the message is about the cliches about love. They are mocked and seen to be untrue with regard to the speaker's love. And as well as appearance is perhaps unimportant and does not determine love in relationships. Perhaps there are other aspects that are more significant. I hope that that was helpful. Um, please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to another Tri Tutors video. In today's video we're going to be analysing the poem Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Some background on the poets. So Ella lived between 1850 and 1919. She was an American author and poet and she started writing her first poetry at the age of eight. Her first poem was published when she was just 13. And this poem was inspired, or she wrote this poem, after trying and failing to comfort a grieving woman. So once we read through the poem, and once we understand um, the themes, that will make a lot of sense as to why she wrote this in response to that incident. Looking at the title, the title is Solitude. And obviously solitude means, you know, being alone. And it's quite an important title in the sense that it is just a single word. And this use of the single word emphasizes the major theme is that we are all on our own. We are all lonely in our journey through life. So having one word as the title is quite um, symbolic of that. Stanza one. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. 
For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing and the hills will answer, sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. So this poet, she's known for writing in a very like simple language, or at least this stanza is quite simple language, but it communicates quite a complex theme. Later on, we'll see the use of more complex imagery, um, but it's very, it's a tricky poem to analyze in the sense that it just keeps building on the same theme or the same message that's being said. And what it is a complex image, she just keeps on using juxtapositions to further drive the point home. So if you notice in every you know set of two lines we have a laugh and weep, later on we have sing and sigh, later on we have in a the next stanza rejoice and grieve, and the last stanza feast and fast. And so these are all juxtapositions that are used throughout the poem. We can also refer to them as antithesis. Um, and these are contradictory ideas which are already driving the point home. So if we look at the first line, laugh and the world laughs with you. The use of world is sort of representing the people of the world. And it's saying that if you laugh, the world will respond with laughter. A positive thought or a positive reaction or a positive action is going to yield a positive reaction. Weep and you weep alone. But however, if you are feeling distressed, if you are grieving, if you're weeping and crying, then there's no one who's going to be able to comfort you and support you. You are on your own in that mission. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth. Um, and so you hear, see here these this sort of these simple words, sad old, um, to describe the earth. And it's almost signifying here, you know, the sad old earth. It's that the earth is sad by default. So maybe this is speaking to the fact that misery is almost something that we deal with all the time and that joy is perhaps short-lived. Um, so the sad of old earth has to borrow its mirth, it has to find laughter, has to find positivity in other things, but has trouble enough of, of its own. So it cannot go ahead and give laughter, or not even laughter, but give comfort because it's too consumed in its own misery. So it's like people have trauma of their own, that they can't actually deal with other people's trauma as well, which is why we live without trauma. You know, we have to deal with it in solitude. Notice the um, internal rhyme, which is a key thing that carries on throughout this poem, because there's a very clear rhyme scheme, but there's also this internal rhyme of earth and mirth later on, bound and sound as well. Notice there's lots of personification in this poem and lots of imagery, and that drives the point home the whole time. It really emphasizes um, the theme of being alone in grief and being surrounded and being the sense of togetherness when there's some laughter when there's positivity sing and the hills will answer sigh it is lost on the air i think that's one of my favorite couplets over there because it is such a wonderful use you know we have sing and sigh which are such similar words um and we can clearly see their juxtaposition so the heels will answer that's clearly personification because heels cannot literally answer so we're using figurative language here and all that it means is sing is like when you're joy when you're feeling joyful when you're happy you would sing and you would sigh when you are upset and when you sing the hills will answer the world will um will you know appreciate it they'll laugh with you they'll sing along with you because everyone craves that sort of positivity but sigh if you're feeling depressed then it is lost in the air the echoes bound to a joyful sound but shrink from voicing care also a very interesting couplet of dialogue so the echoes and echoes are something that react and bound means react so the echoes will react to a joyful sound notice the internal rhyme again which is quite nice in this line because it mimics an echo right because an echo will react to you and it will project the same sound so the internal rhyme is a really nice play on the word echo here so if you are singing if you are happy then your echoes that are going to reach you are going to be joyful however they will shrink from voicing care if you say anything negative or if you're grieving the echoes are not going to shout back they will shrink away and this word voicing is so clever because um voicing care means to comfort someone right if you voice your care you voice your um condolences or you comfort someone 
but voicing also is a you know a term used with echoes it alludes to the use of echo in the previous line that an echo responds to a voice it's the voice being projected back stanza two rejoice and men will seek you grieve and they turn and go they want full measure of all your pleasure but they do not need your woe be glad and your friends are many be sad and you lose them all there are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. So notice from the first stanza, we were talking about the world on the earth. Now we're talking about men and we're going to be using the pronoun they. The pronoun they is significant because it's an exclusive pronoun. It does not include me as the speaker or even you as the reader. And so this emphasizes how the world or people in the world don't want to have anything to do with your suffering. So they are excluding themselves. So rejoice and men will seek you. So if you are happy, if you are rejoicing, then people will want to be around you. They will want to be in your company. However, if you grieve, they turn and go. They will leave you. They do not want to be a part of that suffering. They want full measure of your pleasure. Notice the internal rhyme there with measure and pleasure, and it really adds to this idea of abundance, right? They want every aspect of your pleasure. They want to enjoy what you are enjoying, but they do not need your woe, but they do not need your sorrow. They do not need your distress. So notice that exclusive pronoun being used quite a bit in the stanza. Be glad and your friends are many. Be sad and you lose them all. Simple language to start off with there, but so pertinent and so true. Notice the anaphora. Remember, anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines. In this case, it really emphasizes that the behavior of the world, this is a never-ending pattern of how we treat one another, how we want to be a part of people's joys and celebrations, but we shrink away from, um, you know, or it's this, this um, idea of, we shrink away from maybe comforting them but even if you think about the origin of this poem of the poet trying to comfort this woman and failing to comfort her it's almost this idea that we can shrink away from it but also that we are unable to fully assist other people in their grief we are able to share in their joy but to assist them with their grief is, is challenging so notice now the second person pronouns. We saw it as well in the first stanza, um, but the use of second person pronouns really makes it personally directed towards the reader. And this really emphasizes the message because we are feeling it. So it's not even like she's saying um, I, whereas, you know, that would be also personal and also, you know, we'd understand her story. She's really putting it onto us that we have actually felt this and experienced this. And that imparts it even more, the strength of the message even more. So it's quite self-explanatory. If you're happy, if you're glad, you're going to have many friends. But if you're sad, if you are depressed, or if you are um, not a joy to be around, if you're going through something, then you lose them all. I think this is a bit of hyperbole. It's a bit of an over-exaggeration, but it really emphasizes her point. Notice the dash here. The dash is used to indicate um, a further explanation coming up and is used to really emphasize that right because it really draws the reader's attention and now we're going to use some wonderful figurative metaphoric language there are none to decline your nectared wine but alone you must drink life's goal so there are none to decline meaning there's no one who's going to decline there's no one who's going to say no to nectared wine meaning like sweet wines there's no one who's going to resist your offering of joining into the celebrations but alone you must deal with life's resentment and the annoyance and the the horrors of life maybe horrors is a bit of too strong of a word but the difficulties of life you need to deal with alone the third and final stanza feast and your halls are crowded fast and the world goes by succeed and give and it helps you live but no man can help you die there is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. 
So now we get into the last stanza, which is by far the most melancholic of all the stanzas, I would say. And we are now going to go, we went from the world in the first stanza to men in the second stanza. And now we're going to go to the solitary man. So we really are understanding how we are um, sort of progressing from you can be joyful with others. And then as soon as things start getting more difficult and challenging, it gets like fewer people are able to assist you. And then now as you approach death, because this is all a bit of a euphemistic um, re um, referral to death in the last few lines, you are on your own. There is no one who can help you. So notice the juxtaposition just to start off our final stanza, feast versus fast. So feast is if you have positivity to offer, right? You have an abundance of something. Your halls are crowded. Crowded has connotations of abundance. There's so many people, so many people want to enjoy the celebration. Fast, meaning you have nothing to offer. Maybe you are struggling and the world goes by, which is sort of metaphoric in the sense that they don't see your pain. The world goes by, they don't even notice, or they seem not to notice your pain. Succeed and give, and it helps you live. So if you succeed in life, if you're giving to, to others, right? And giving in the sense of you're giving joy, you're giving something positive, obviously, then it helps you live. It helps you to prosper and even just survive in this world, right? Because we need other people in order to survive. But no man can help you die. And so now she's introducing this idea of death, which is going to be elaborated on in the next part of the stanza. And we've, as we said, we shifted from world to men to man. And in this line, you know, using the use of the singular form man emphasizes that no individual in the world is exempt and none can help you during this plight, meaning that everyone is experiencing, experiencing this. No man is exempt from being able to um, you know, go to his death with the help of others, but also that not a single person, do you see how um, that's really emphasizing this message? Not a single person can help you die, not even the closest person that you have. This is something that you have to undertake yourself. It is a solitary venture. You must go through the pain and suffering alone. It is part of the human experience when you reach that point in your life. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train. So there's room, just like there's halls um, in the first line of the stanza and here, there is there are aeons of space. Like if you think of um, halls, meaning like really big open areas, there's so much place for people to come and enjoy your pleasure. And here we have a large and lordly train. Notice the alliteration, large and lordly. And this alliteration of the L sound, it's like quite a longing sound and it emphasizes the grandeur and the scale of the train that's coming through. And the train is obviously not a literal train. It's a metaphor, people who are enjoying your joy with you, um, who are reveling in your celebration. But, and but always shows a change, a shift. We've used that word, she's used that word quite a bit in this poem to emphasize the juxtaposition. But one by one, one by one, also such a significant use of the word or really emphasizing the theme of this poem which is about solitude one by one we must file on if you file on it's almost like this acceptance of fate and so the speaker is saying we have accepted this fate that we must do this alone we must approach our death in solitude and um, we must approach grief in solitude so one by one really emphasizing how um, we arrive at death as a solitary person through the narrow aisles of pain so narrow is restricted there's no space for anyone else if you're walking down a narrow street you have to walk in a single file and so talking about narrow aisles or narrow paths of pain there's no one to help you when experiencing the pain or even when you're on the pathway to death or in of enduring this incredible pain that's going to lead you there there is no one who can assist you no one who can understand your pain as their own no one who can offer comfort that will actually yield the comfort that you 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 are longing for so quite a melancholic end to the poem but i don't think that we can define this poem as depressing i definitely would not this is more of a commentary about this or a reflection about this key aspect of all of our lives 
So let's analyze this a little bit further. If we look at the structure, each stanza starts the first two lines with verbs, and this brings coherence to the piece. It also shows whatever you do and how the world will respond. So it links to this theme of reactions, that positive reactions yield, well, positive um, thoughts yield positive reactions, negative behavior yields negative reactions. The rhyme scheme in the, in the stanzas looks like A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E, because we have you, then we have alone, which rhymes with own, mirth by itself, answer by itself, air rhymes with care, and then sound. So it's really quite lyrical in that regard. The rhyme scheme really makes this a coherent piece and it really communicates how thought out all of these lines are. In terms of the language, I find this quite interesting. There's a mix between simple diction and more complex comparisons and figurative language to drive the point home and to embellish what's being said. So there's lots of imagery to convey the themes. If we look at the tone, we could say the tone is sincere, thoughtful, reflective, contemplative. In the last stanza, especially the last few lines, I would say that it's melancholic. Notice in each stanza, it's, so it's eight lines each stanza, but it sort of makes it seem like it's two quatrains in each stanza. There's like two groups of lines of four. So that second one, and the last sort of quatrain in inverted commas, in that last stanza could be defined. I think the tone could be melancholic. I think you have proof for that. The mood is solemn. It's thought provoking. There's the sense of honesty and authenticity and sincerity. In terms of the theme and the message, the difficult reality of life that we are alone, the individual versus the group, the idea of self-reliance, the sentiment that life is a solo venture. But ultimately, I would say it's quite ironic in the sense that this entire poem is about how we are alone and especially in grief, how we are alone. And yet, because we all experience solitude, because we all have to suffer through painful experiences alone, there's this unifying commonality among us. So what seems like a simple poem is actually quite complex and quite thought provoking. I hope that you found that video helpful. I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to another Try Teachers video. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the poem The Morning Sun is Shining by Olive Schreiner. The poet, Olive Schreiner, she was born in 1855 and died in 1920. She was a South African poet, author and activist. So she was quite ahead of her time in terms of her activism for feminism, anti-racism and anti-war. She lived during the Anglo-Boer War, but this poem is not actually about any of her activism ventures. Um, but it's just really interesting to know in terms of this poet and what she accomplished. If we have a look at our title, The Morning Sun is Shining, notice the capitalizations. Capitalizations always show significance. If you think about morning, morning has a connotation of hope or renewal, optimism. It's a new opportunity. There's this representation that it's a new day, it's a new opportunity. Um, and shining is also a really positive word. So it has positive connotations of hope and light and beauty. Our first quatrain, so this is this poem is one singular stanza, but we can split it up into four different quatrains, four different groups of four lines. The morning sun is shining on the green, green willow tree and sends a golden sunbeam to dance upon my knee. If we look at the first two lines, we have anaphora. The anaphora is repeated throughout the poem. Anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines. And in this case, the repetition of the the emphasizes the abundance of the beauty of nature. The morning sun is shining on. We spoke about that as well because that has got to do with it's the same line as the title. The green, green willow tree. Notice the enjambment in those lines, the run on lines. 
And this emphasizes how the beauty of nature is limitless and unrestrained. It is not confined or defined by nature um, or by conventional punctuation. You can view this poem in sort of a romantic light. The romantic poetry movement was all about praising nature and really admiring the beauty of nature and about linking emotion to nature. And so this poem definitely falls into that category. Green, there are a lot of colors that are used throughout this poem. And so green is, has connotations of symbol, it symbolizes growth and life and prosperity. Um, and so the repetition of the green emphasizes that message further. Willow tree, notice the natural imagery and natural imagery usually showcases something that's righteous, something that's good, something that's beautiful. And sends a golden sunbeam. Notice throughout the poem how many times sun is repeated. Sun, sun, beam, sunshine, which is really emphasizing this beauty and light. Golden, once again, we have a beautiful color being brought here. Colors are important as they enrich the imagery. And these particular colors are colors of positivity. Gold has connotations of rich, beautiful. This is an example of personification as well. The sun is sending a golden sunbeam. But a better example of personification is in the fourth line, to dance upon my knee. The sunbeam, notice the enjambment of that line as well, the sunbeam is dancing. This is personification, it's emphasizing the power of the sunbeam and the happiness and the joy that it brings. Um, dance has a really positive connotation. Moving on to quatrain two. The fountain bubbles merrily, the yellow locust spring of life and light and sunshine, the happy brown birds sing. Once again, we see the anaphora here, the fountain bubbles merrily, another example of personification. Think about if you describe someone as bubbly, it means they're really upbeat, they're really positive. And the fact that they are merry, merry so merrily, um, is a human quality of joy. And if you think about going back to the word bubbles, if you think about bubbles, it's a really fun and playful word. The connotations of like of children. Also, you think about water and when water is bubbling, there's usually an abundance of it. So this is showing us that, um, you know, this nature is thriving. There is this beauty in the air. The yellow locust spring. Yellow is indicative of sunlight and joy. Spring over here. Um, is polysemic. It can refer to the season spring or it can refer to spring in terms of you know jumping and it has connotations of excitement and spirit and enthusiasm and energy and optimism. Of life and light, notice the alliteration of the L sound there. It's a lilting and longing sound which emphasizes the lightness and excitement. The longingness is almost the sense of lethargy but in a quite a positive way. And sunshine, Notice the repetition of the sun imagery, as we said. The happy brown birds sing. Notice the alliteration, brown birds. Um, it really is a bouncy or excited sound. And notice that the birds aren't just a part of the scenery, but they're feeling the joy too, because it doesn't just say, um, you know, we are hearing the songs of the birds. The brown birds are actually singing. So we're using that active voice. Now we get our third quatrain, and our third quatrain is still positive, just like the other two quatrains before it, but it has a hint towards the melancholy of the final quatrain, so you'll see if you notice it. Notice the anaphora here, once again, emphasizing that abundance in nature. The earth is clothed with beauty, the air is filled with song, the yellow thorn trees load the wind with odors sweet and strong. So if you notice, we have the word clothed, filled and load in this quatrain. And this is important because these three words have connotations of abundance. And it's indicative of this abundance of beauty in nature, this abundance of splendidness or of splendor. Um, the earth is clothed in beauty. That's a bit of personification. The air is filled with songs. We're looking at all these different aspects and we're just indicating through imagery and through these, this beautiful diction, how beautiful the earth is, how wonderful nature is, and how happy it makes the speaker. Um, song is being repeated, you know, that we have the birds that were singing, now we have a reference to song, and in the final stanza we're going to have a question of what song truly is. And then this is where we get the hint towards the melancholy of the final quatrain. 
Yellow, once again, is positive, but thorn trees, we can see this in two regards. Firstly, the imagery of thorn trees can represent the South African landscape because in South Africa, we see a lot of thorn trees. It's one of the indigenous um, plants that we have, but it could also be hinting at the last quatrain, which is melancholic because thorn trees can cause harm and they don't provide much protection from the elements. So it could be hinting towards the final quatrain where the speaker is going to talk about um, something negative or this depression that she feels or this questioning and introspection that she is going through. So the yellow thorn trees load the wind with odours sweet and strong. And then my next thing is this word odours because odours is a really interesting word choice because odours are typically, um, you know, they typically have negative connotations or something smelling bad. Otherwise, if you wanted to do something positive with regard to smell, you would say the scent right? So the use of odours could hint towards that final stanza, but they are still described as sweet and strong. Notice the sibilant sound there, the repetition of the S sound, um, and it really creates a calm and gentle feeling. Moving on to the final stanza. There is a hand I never touch and a face I never see. Now what is sunshine? What is song? Now what is light to me? So we've had these th three really blissful, beautiful quatrains and we get to the final quatrain and there's a remarkable shift in tone. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we go through the structural analysis in the next slide. But there is a major shift in tone from blissful to introspective and melancholic. And now the speaker is going to reflect on what she's just said about nature. There is one example of a personal pronoun in terms of my in the first um, quatrain, but the use of I in this very first line of the stanza shows that there is a shift now. We're not just going to be talking about nature, we're going to be talking about the speaker's interpretation of it or the speaker's reflection on it. There is a hand I never touch. Notice touch and then see the use of the senses. Just like use of colour, the use of the senses communicates effectively with the reader. There is a hand and a face. This is example, an example of synecdoche. Synecdoche is when a part represents a whole or when a whole represents a part. In this case, she's not just missing a hand or just not just missing a face, right? She's missing a person. But the use of synecdoche, this is really significant because it really draws out the longing and the pain she feels as she um, reaches for this person in her mind and a face I never see. So we have this understanding that this person has gone away, that she has lost this person. It is personal, therefore, because she is remarking on a personal incident. However, it's universal, or we can adapt it to be universal, because it's not really clear in terms of has the person passed on? Has the person, have they, is it, has it been a romantic relationship where the person has broken up with her? So we don't actually know the specifics, but what we do know is that she has experienced this loss. And then as a result of this loss, we have the final two lines, which are so poignant and so heart-wrenching. Um, now what is sunshine? What is song? Now what is life to me? Light to me. So we've had the mention of sunshine and song and light in the previous um, quatrains where we really understood the speaker's fascination with nature and how nature is so beautiful. And now she's, have to re she's having to redefine these aspects of her life. Um, as a result of this loss. She is questioning. She needs to figure out what is sunshine to her now? What is song? What is actual light to her in this new post-loss loss existence? Notice the anaphora here, and this anaphora is different to the previous anaphoras. Now it is emphasizing how much questioning she's doing, how everything seems to be lost. It seems to be overwhelming. The repetition of now was also indicative of the fact that in the past she had all this beauty or she associated all this beauty with, um, you know, with her life or this beauty of nature was her life and now she's questioning it. In terms of our structure, we have a rhyme scheme of A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E, G, H, I, H, J, K, L, K. So it's a really wonderful rhyme scheme which adds to the lyrical element, the song-like quality of the poem. If we look, it's one long stanza, one single stanza, and this is showing this continuous thought of feeling. It's showing that the speaker is one with nature, but we do have four quatrains within it, which each end with a full stop. The first quatrain sets the scene, 
for what is happening. The second one expands on the scene's description. The third one indicates the abundance of nature. And the fourth one is a shift to a melancholic introspection or reflection. The rhythm is regular and it's song-like, which links to that rhyme scheme. There's lots of anaphora and enjambment, which emphasizes this theme of abundance and excitement. The tone of the poem, at first glance, is vibrant, blissful, peaceful, serene and calming. And then, as we progress into the final four lines, we get a heavy-hearted, lonely, melancholic, uncertain, reflective, contemplative and introspective tone. The mood is joyful, passionate and reflective. The theme of the poem is about the beauty of nature and how it can offer solace and meaning. The joy of human connection and the loneliness of loss. It's about reevaluating life after loss. This is really one of my favourite poems. I hope that you understand it in a clearer way after watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to another Try Tutors video. In today's video we're going to be unpacking the poem At a Funeral by Dennis Brutus. So a little bit about our poet and understanding the poet is always important in terms of understanding the main themes and the main messages and the context overall of the poem in which we are studying. So Dennis Brutus was a really interesting man. I would highly recommend that you research him to gain a further understanding of his interesting life. He was a South African anti-apartheid activist. He lived between 1924 and 2009. He was a teacher, an activist, a poet and a journalist. And his writings were banned for a number of years because of the fact that they were anti-apartheid. Um, you know, they were centered on anti-apartheid themes um, and they criticized the government. And so they were actually censored and banned in South Africa during a period of time. He was jailed for his attempt to have South Africa excluded from the Olympic Games. So during the apartheid era, anti-apartheid activists sought to um, campaign international bodies such as the United Nations, such as the Olympic Committee, so that um, they would exclude South Africa from these world events. And in that way, they hoped that the South African government would feel pressurized to change their ways and to reverse the rulings of this oppressive regime. So he was actually jailed for, for this attempt that um, to exclude South Africa from the Olympic Games in order to reverse apartheid policies. Let's have a look at our title. The title of this poem is At a Funeral, and it's a pretty straightforward title at first glance. Now, it's important to know that this poem was written in response to a specific event that transpired. Um, Dennis Brutus was aware of this African woman, this young woman who had been studying to be a doctor. And during the apartheid era, you know, to become a doctor, even in today's times, is, a, is a such a big deal, right? And during the apartheid era, if you were an African person who was, who had managed to, uh, you know, become a doctor, this was even a bigger deal. And it signified a lot of sacrifice that you had made yourself and that your family had made. And it's such a tragic story because after receiving her certificate, after receiving her degree and becoming a doctor, this woman actually passed away. Um, and so this is Dennis Brutus's reflections as he is standing at her funeral and she is representative of this um, lost gift. We're going to see that use of gift later on in the poem, um, but it's this sort of lost gift to the world. She had so much to offer, so much to bring, and it's such a tragedy that she that she has died and Dennis Brutus is, you know, at her funeral. Um, there's even more to this title, even though it seems really straightforward, but we spoke about the fact that this is giving us the setting and to me it's a very very sincere and authentic poem it's almost like reading his diary and he's put at as the title at a funeral like this is my setting right like you would write in your diary like at school one day he's written at a funeral and so it's, he's going to give us these reflections on this event and he's giving us the setting um to put us in the right perspective put us in the right headspace what's interesting is the fact that he does use an indefinite article the A is an indefinite article. And usually when you use an indefinite article, it shows the lack of specificity, which is a direct contradiction to what we've just said about this being a specific woman who he is mourning. 
Um, but perhaps this can signify, and we're going to talk about later, how this poem starts off as being something specific. But in my opinion, it morphs into this general comment about, you know, anti-apartheid ideals and things like that. Um, and the toll of the struggle on so on, on South African people. Um, and so perhaps this A could signify the frequency to the number of funerals that Dennis Brutus has attended, which is a very sad, morbid thought. Something else that's important is, you know, from the very first line of this poem, we're going to be pushed into this um, political context, right? Because anti-apartheid um, writers are political writers, fundamentally. And so something important to know about the um, about the history of South Africa is that the apartheid government would ban anti-apartheid movements, right? The ANC, the PAC, they were banned. They were not allowed to come together and talk and plan protests. That was forbidden. And so what happened was, um, is that anti-apartheid activists had to figure out a way to communicate um, without, obviously, um, you know, having banned meetings. I mean, of course they did, but they did have meetings that were not supposed to happen, according to the government. But a way that they got around this was at funerals, because at funerals you were allowed to have a large group of people because you were mourning that person. So funerals were actually places of political meetings. This was a place where, um, you know, leaders of the anti-apartheid movements would talk and under the cover of a funeral. So that's just a little bit of context about our title, and it's giving us that understanding of where we're at. And now we can unpack the two stanzas in this poem. Our first stanza is very much specific to the um, to the woman who has died, who has inspired this poem. Black, green, and gold at sunset, pageantry, and stubbled graves, expectant of eternity. In bride's white, nun's white, veils, the nurses gush their bounty of red, white, red wine cloaks, frothing the bugled dirge and slopes, salute, then ponder all this hollow penalty for one whose gifts the mud devours with our hopes. Such eloquent writing. Um, there's a lot of words in there that are quite complex or not typical in our everyday language, but really beautiful words to convey this message. So we start off black, green and gold. Black, green and gold are the colours of the ANC flag and the ANC was a well was the predominant force in the anti-apartheid movement so this can signify the fact that this is a funeral of this you know it's a funeral of this woman obviously that we know um based on the context but that perhaps this has got something to do with you know anti-apartheid she has defied what the apartheid government has said of african people right she has gone ahead and has graduated with such a prestigious degree and is um, on her way to helping so many people and so she is being honored as almost this military leader honored as this um, victim of apartheid well not a victim of apartheid but rather as this leader this major figure um, during this time um, I think it's also significant that it starts with the color black because of the racial connotation, obviously, that is associated with that. But black, green and gold are the colors of the ANC. And then we have the use of sunset. This is the time that we're in. And sunset is symbolic of a life ending, just like the day ends. So it's really fitting for a funeral. And then we have a colon. And remember, nothing goes unnoticed in poetry. Every tiny full stop, colon, lack of colon or lack of full stop are always significant. And so this is really giving us an understanding, indicating that he's going to basically go um, and give this very firm statement. And what he does is the next word, he says pageantry. And pageantry is an elaborate display of something. It's this big ceremony that you have. Um, and this is significant because if there's so much pageantry just like we have the black green and gold at sunset 
um, this connotes that this is an important member of the apartheid resistance or this is an important figure in this movement or during this time period who has inspired so many. And so the fact that her funeral is full of pageantry shows or the caliber of person that she was. And then we have some enjambment. We are continuing on to the next line without a full stop. And stubbled graves. Stubbled is this bristly growth of grass, right? So the stubbled graves, that's what it means. This grass is growing on top of the graves. And to me, that could signify that perhaps these are recent graves, that the grass is just starting to grow on top of the graves. Maybe these are fighters or activists who have been lost. Um, the fact that it's plural shows how many graves there are and how this is a moment that perhaps, you know, once again, linking back to that A, that indefinite article, perhaps this is something that happens all too often, this tragedy that strikes. The colon here is used to elaborate. And then we have such an interesting set of words or such a beautiful and a very tragic way. Expectant of eternity. Notice the alliteration of the E sound there, expectant of eternity. And this alliteration is extremely effective because it emphasizes the sort of the extremity or the length of the eternity. This is a prolonged eternity. The, it emphasizes the finality of death. Their death will never be reversed. They will be dead forevermore. So a really sort of tragic but beautiful way to say that, expectant of eternity. In brides white, nuns white, veils the nurses gush their bounty of red white, red wine cloaks. So if you think of a bride and you think of a nun, you think of purity, you think of holiness. And this is a direct reference to this woman's death. She remembers she had become a doctor. And so all these nurses have come to gather at her funeral and pay their respects. And nurses are typically dressed in white. They can also be dressed in red. That's sort of the typical nurse's uniform. And so the fact that you have the brides and the nuns, that imagery of purity and holiness, you know, nurses and doctors do such pure and holy work in the sense that they're saving people's lives. That is sort of the highest calling, right? Or one of the highest calling. Um, veils is a sense of concealment. And we're going to see that later on as well. Um, this idea of concealment and hiding. So we see it in veils and we also see it in the next line, cloaks. Quite honestly, these two lines are the lines that have given me sleepless nights in terms of trying to unpack them because there's a lot of contrasting information here. If you think of the word bounty, the bounty, oh, the word bounty is actually quite a positive word because it means a reward or a prize and gush indicates there's a flow of something so it's almost like there's this flow of this bounty there's so many of these um of these nurses that have come to pay their respects but to me it's slightly strange that it is a positive word um this word bounty that they've used this positive word but perhaps it can signify the fact that you know it's such a beautiful sight to see so many people coming to pay their respects um, this red wine cloak, as I said earlier, it's this deep red color. This is what um, nurses wear. Um, I automatically also thought of blood, but I don't think that that has the right connotation in this regard when we're talking about all of these veils, all of these cloaks, all of these nurses coming to pay their respects. Frothing the bugled, dodging slopes. Frothing, if something's frothing, it's this overflow of small bubbles. There's a lot of reference to something. There's actually a lot of contradiction. You have lots of words in this poem which are overflowing, like gush and frothing. And later on, we're going to see the words that depict something, the, you know, the opposite, where there's nothing, where there's a dearth, where there's this devouring. Bugled. A bugle is an instrument that is synonymous with funerals and memorials. So once again, hinting this is a very important person because a bugle is being played at her funeral. But it's so interesting um, the way that the poet, he inverts words or he uses in inverted commas the wrong version of the word. So here, instead of saying he hears a bugle, which would be the noun form, he's using the adjective, the bugled. So we can hear this bugle instrument in the background 
dirging serps. A dirging is a song or a hymn of grief. It's like a lament. And this word slopes is really significant, right? A slope, what does a slope do? It rises and then falls. And so you can almost hear the music through this word slopes. So it's such a beautiful way to depict sound. I think typically we think of if we're going to depict sound, we need a sound device. But we can see here through the diction that this um, the diction itself has created or has mimicked the sound for us. We can see the slope of the sound. We can hear the bugle going up and then going down, um, which almost mimics the way that we start our life and end our life if we're going to read very much into it. But even just going back a step, it just mimics how the bugle rises and falls. Salute. This salute is really powerful and it's emphatic because we have that exclamation mark remember how punctuation is so important and so that exclamation mark really emphasizes the power of this command to salute and this salute is could be two things it could be a sign of respect right at like a military funeral when someone has died you will you'll see the the rest of the army they will salute that person but it could also be a call to action due to these deaths due to tragedy of what's happened this is a call to action and that's important in terms of understanding this poem in the context of apartheid because it's not just a regular funeral this funeral represents so much and this woman represents so much then ponder all this hollow panoply for one whose gifts the mud devours with our hopes so then ponder and now he's going to, he's, he's cause of called everyone to attention, everyone's um, being called to action, and then he's actually thinking. And he's going through here, and this reminds me of the diary entry once again, this is such an authentic and sincere poem. He's walking us through how he's thinking. Ponder means consider or think about all this hollow, hollow means empty, panel P. This is this splendid or extensive display. This is this ostentatious um, pageantry that's been given to this funeral that's been piled onto this funeral for one whose gifts the mud devours and he says this pageantry is hollow because this is such a tragic event because that pageantry is not going to reverse the fact that this person for one this woman whose gifts what do gifts represent they represent potential they have such positive connotations what you could offer to the world what happens to all these gifts? The mud devours them. And here we have personification. The mud is given the power of a human being to devour something. If you devour something, well, firstly, mud has negative connotations in itself, right? But devours has such powerful negative connotations as well. It's to eat hungrily, to quickly eat, but also to destroy something, right? You can talk about like the fire devours the house. That means the the house has completely been engulfed in flames. And so here we can see that the mud devours such a negative connotation, such a powerful image. It's this hungry mud that has taken away all the gifts, all the potential that this woman offered. And with that, with our hopes. This person had so much to give and had inspired so much hope. This was a person who had defied every expectation, who had made sacrifices and who was a representation of um, of hope. And now with her death, with her tragic death, that hope has been devoured along with her gifts. So it's a really, really sad lament. And now we move on to the second stanza. Oh, all you frustrate ones, powers tombed in dirt, aborted, not by death, but carrying books of birth. Arise, the brassy shout of freedom stirs our earth. Not death, but death's head tyranny scythes our ground and plots our narrow cells of pain, defeat and dearth. Better that we should die than that we should lie down. And to me, stanza two represents a bit of a shift because stanza one has been very specific to the specific funeral. And stanza two, while it is still at the same funeral, this is more of a reflection of the toll of the apartheid, of fighting apartheid, and how these deaths are even more tragic because they're not just deaths, they're deaths within this particular context. 
we start off with something called apostrophe and this is not apostrophe like the punctuation mark apostrophe is when you are it's a similar it's a type of personification it's more extreme it's when you address an inanimate object or a concept or someone who has passed on as though they are there as though they are human and here the speaker addresses the frustrate ones meaning the dead people the graves that he's just passed he says oh which is this interjection or this exclamation um so he's very passionate we can see this he says all you frustrate ones remember we spoke about bugled and we said he uses it in the wrong form of the word here he uses it again right you wouldn't usually say frustrate ones, you'd say frustrated ones. You'd try and put it in an adjectival form. And here he keeps it in the verb form though. And that's significant because what he's doing is he's emphasizing the actions of the people who have passed on. Right? This woman who has died, these other young people who have tragically died for their country or for a specific, you know, or even just as a tragedy, these people had action in their lives they were frustrating the status quo they were frustrating um you know this oppression and so the use of frustrated the use of the inverted in inverted commas the wrong form of the word is significant it emphasizes the actions of the dead so he talks to these to these dead people he says oh all you frustrate ones and then he calls them powers tombed in dirt also what an interesting piece of imagery over here powers these are people who are powerful in their life who were activists or who were challenging the norms or were just living their life in such a positive way these are powers and they're tombed in dirt now a tomb can be something really you know it can be an almost positive word if you think about egypt you think about like the king's tomb it's something extremely elaborate but these graves are not these elaborate marble um, you know constructions or pyramid like structures they are tombed in dirt dirt negative connotation just like mud right if you think of you could use dirt and mud or you could use soil right they're all sort of synonyms but the use of mud and dirt are used negatively because dirt is ill-fitting of those who had all these gifts to offer the world right they do not deserve the way that they have been treated they do not deserve this expectant of eternity right they don't need to deserve this it is such so tragic this dirt is ill-fitting aborted not by death but carrying books of birth such a powerful line and this is where we get more philosophical and we get more he's making a comment about society aborted aborted means brought to a premature end and so obviously this makes sense in the context because this is a young woman who has died this is a premature ending to her life, right? She's not this old person who has lived their lives. She had so much to still offer, um, offer the world. And he says that these people, all these graves, were not, they were not, were not killed or did not die by death. Notice that death is capitalized, so it's personified as a person, right? That death is a person who is responsible for killing people a lot of poems do this and it's something that sometimes we miss out on because it's often been done but this use of the capital letter and the fact that death is being you know it's, it's told that death is not responsible it's using death it's personifying death as this person and they haven't been brought to their premature end by death and this is significant in two ways i'll tell you the first way now and then the second way once we continue on this line but not by death because their legacy lives on right they continue to live on they have not been um, prematurely deceased because their legacy will live on they'll live forever but more importantly but carrying books of birth what has actually caused their their death what has actually caused their premature demise carrion is the decaying flesh of dead animals what are these books of birth Notice the alliteration of this very powerful B sound. What are these carrion books of birth? These carrion books of birth are this, if you think about books, you can think about legislation. Um, and these books of birth is talking about past books. And the past books, well, the past system in South Africa during apartheid was a horrific system that um, defined the 
you know, your movements, basically, as an African person. As an African person, you were not allowed to be in certain areas at certain times. And if you wanted to be in certain areas, you had to have permission, in inverted commas, you actually had to have a passbook. And this was a major, major source of anti-apartheid activism, because what it essentially did was it, def it sort of restricted, well, not sort of, it really restricted you, right? Um, and it was something that was incredibly, incredibly um, meaningful because what the apartheid system attempted to do was to make African people feel as though they were not belonging in their own country because they had to carry a passport everywhere they went. They weren't allowed to be in their own country. So it's a very pertinent sign. And a lot of anti-apartheid um, resistance involved burning passports. Also, if you did not have your passbook with you, you could be arrested very, very easily by the military or by the police. And so he is saying that it's not actually death that causes these people to be brought to this premature demise, but it's actually the passbook system. Because your race is decided at birth, it's assigned at birth, and it is unchangeable. And once you are assigned a specific race, it's almost like you are restricted from the start. And that has brought about your premature end, not death. You have been restricted from the moment of your birth. Isn't that such a powerful comment to make? These books of birth that you have been restricted and you have been brought to this premature end, not by death but by birth itself just by the fact of you having been born a specific race or assigned a certain race at birth now your future is sort of unchangeable so a really powerful comment here um, against the apartheid government i apologize because i have put arise on that line on the second line but actually arise goes on to the next line so my apologies there um it is a bit of, you know, in German, there's no full stop there. It just goes, arise, the next line. Arise, exclamation mark, just like salute sort of references that. And another call to action, exclamation mark. The brassy shout of freedom stirs our earth. Brassy or brassy means shiny. And it's a shout. If someone shouts, it's very emotive. Notice the personification of freedom, it's capitalized, but also it's shouting. So that's personification, giving this um, idea, this concept, such human qualities. And whenever we use personification, it always shows the power of something. So it's showing the power of freedom here. Um, stirs our earth. The freedom is also stirring the earth, another form of personification. What does it mean, stirs? If you stir something, you're upending the system, right? You're changing the system. You are causing a shift. Um, our earth is really significant. I think that the use of our shows this sort of nuclear environment, like this is a very South African um, understanding or like it's closely related to the speaker. Our earth, like our entire existence. So not maybe the entire world, but our earth, like the earth around us. But also think about a grave where you are disturbing the earth in order to dig the grave so it works on many levels not death and now he's going to reinforce once again that this demise or the tragedy is all the tragedy is death but it's not all about the death but death's head tyranny so death is not the only thing that's responsible here but death's head tyranny what do you think that could be well, that is definitely the apartheid regime. The apartheid regime was cruel and oppressive. Tyranny means cruel, a cruel and oppressive system. And um, they are death's head. If you just think of the head of something, even it's like this epitome of evil. And so this um, death's head has been personified to incorporate or to, um, to reference the apartheid government and the apartheid regime and how cruel and oppressive. A scythe is a, is a typical, it's actually an agricultural tool, but and it's a tool used for cutting crops, but it is a symbol of death because death comes and sort of uses this tool to, to kill people. And this tool is now the apartheid, is in the apartheid government's hands. And it's not even meaning death literally, but it's meaning how they have been killing and how they have been um, destroying so many people's lives our ground once again that reference to 
our, this nuclear environment. Also, our is an inclusive pronoun. And so this is significant because it's really including everyone in this, in this argument. So it's showing as much as this is a authentically and sincere, authentic and sincere poem, like a personal poem, it's also about the plight of all of the people, all of the South African people suffering under apartheid. Ground is also significant, you know, earth and ground because it's got to do with graves, but it's also about territory, right? About South Africa. And plots our narrow cells of pain, defeat and death. Plots. I think plots can be used tw like in two ways here. So firstly, it's a bit of a pun because a plot can be, you know, a plot of land where you're going to have the grave. But deaths, it's talking about deaths head tyranny, meaning the apartheid government who are the epitome of, you know, evilness, and they are plotting. If you plot something, it's intentional. And what are they plotting? They are plotting these narrow. Think about the word narrow. Narrow is confined. It's restricted. These cells of pain. The imagery of cells makes, me, makes you think of a prison cell, right? Which makes a lot of sense because the apartheid government imprisoned all these people who were resisting this oppressive regime. So this is polysemic because it can refer to prison cells. And then something else is, it's a bit of a stretch, but I think it's quite an interesting one. It can also refer to like the cells of your body makeup, right? Like we are made up of millions and trillions of cells. And it's almost like they have been, you know, the apartheid government has, you know, really restricted every single cell of your body even. They have made sure that pain permeates every single cell. So whether it's the prison cell or it's the cell of your body, it's this idea that pain is in every single cell because a cell is such a small, tiny thing. And so the fact that he's talking about many cells and he's talking about each cell has this aspect of pain, defeat and death. It's such a powerful form of imagery. I find it interesting that there's no, there's not a comma here. It's pain, defeat and death, which is slightly strange to me. Um... If you have any thoughts about why that could be, let me know. Defeat and death, there we have alliteration, um, that sort of harsh D sound over there, um, because it's showing this lack of something, right? It's this defeat, it's this deprivation. And death links to the word hollow that we that we read earlier. It's almost like how apartheid has deprived um, people of so many things because a darth is just is like this you just think of a desert it's the scarcity there's nothing there's a lack of something there's a lack of empathy there's a lack of so many things under the apartheid regime and then we have a colon and now we're going to get to this very powerful last line which really emphasizes how we've gone from this very specific at a specific funeral to a more um, general understanding or this call to action from this funeral. So it's really this authentic reflection that the speaker goes through. And he ends off the poem, better that we should die than that we should lie down. So he says it's better to die rather than to give up. Um, notice the use of we, the inclusive pronoun. It's a sense of unity and solidarity. Lie down symbolizes giving up. Notice there's not even a full stop at the end of this poem. And that can signify that the struggle continues. The struggle is not over. And perhaps his reflections are not over. But ultimately, there is still a lot to be fighting for. So a little bit of analysis in terms of the different po um, poetic you know, terminology devices. The structure of the poem there's a lot of enjambment, um, and that enjambment, the run on lines, is effective because it emphasizes the reflective spirit, right? This um, sincere reflection, he's not being restricted by, you know, typical or conventional punctuation norms. He's just writing from the heart. There are irregular lines. Um, there is no full stop at the end. The first stanza is quite descriptive, and the second stanza is almost a comment on um on the first stanza or a comment on society at that present moment. Notice the difference of, or the, the contradiction or the combination, we have the overflow versus the hollowness. And there's this overflow of pain and then this hollowness of freedom. The tone of the poem is reflective, contemplative, assertive. 
impassioned in the second stanza, optimistic in the last line, pensive in the first stanza. So I would use different words to describe the tone in the first verse of the second stanza. The mood in the first stanza is quite disconcerting, it's quite unsettling. And the second stanza, the mood right, right at the bottom at the end of the poem is um, quite uplifting, the last line. But I would say the previous part of the second stanza is still that sort of unsettling, assertive, even angry um, mood and tone. The themes, death, hope, never giving up, resistance and its consequences, bravery, um, and apartheid and its injustice and harsh regime, and ultimately tragedy. Please remember that this is just my analysis of the poem. If you have different ideas, then that is great. Um, poetry is all about interpretation. But the thing is, is if you do have different ideas, make sure that you know how to justify your ideas. So make sure that you know what you can quote in your answer and how you can actually um, argue your perspective. That is absolutely critical. So I hope that that makes this poem a little bit more easier to understand. It is quite a challenging poem. I'll be the first to say it. Um, so if you have any other, you know, interpretations, please let me know and make sure that you reference where you're getting that information from in terms of what line of the poem gives you that idea. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this video was helpful and I would really appreciate if you'd like and subscribe the video. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to another Try to Readers video. In today's video, we're going to be unpacking the poem The Shipwreck by Emily Dickinson. So a little bit of information about our poet. This is always important as it gives the context of to the poem and it makes our understanding of the poem a lot richer and deeper. Emily Dickinson lived between 1830 and 1886. She was an American poet and only 10 of her poems were actually published during her lifetime. The rest were published after her death. And a lot of her poems are about this key theme, which is the power of nature. And we're definitely going to see that come across in this poem. So I titled The Shipwreck. We can understand this quite literally. This is a poem about a shipwreck that occurred near this coastal town and how it has um, become this sort of story and this legend that is told to children um, but it's a really harrowing and traumatic tale. If we look at the um, we can say that that's a definite article so this is a specific shipwreck that um, the children are being told about and the connotations of a shipwreck is tragedy and destruction and really also the power of nature because if you think of a ship as a symbol of man's ability to create and then the fact that it can be wrecked by a storm shows that ultimately no matter what man does nature always has the upper hand nature has the ability to destroy um, whatever humanity put you know whatever successes humanity has nature has this ability to tear that apart so ultimately nature is the superior power our first stanza glee the great storm is over Four have recovered the land, forty gone down together into the boiling sand. So it's quite an ironic and shocking first word because our title is The Shipwreck and then we start off with glee, which is like this unadulterated joy. So it's a really unexpected start. We also have this exclamation mark, which is emphasizing how emphatic it is, how excited people are that the storm is finally over. And so there's this sort of contradiction because as much as the shipwreck is going to cause all this drama and cause all this pain and so many people are going to die and there's this really big loss, at the same time there's this sense of appreciation for those who survived um, and also for the fact that the rest of the town has escaped this dangers of the storm and the effects of it. The great storm is over, great emphasizing how big and damaging it was. And the storm, the storm obviously called, caused the shipwreck. Another exclamation mark emphasizes the fact that the storm is over and this is a cause for celebration. Four have recovered the land. So four of the people who were on the ship have made it back to land. So there have been four survivors. And now we're going to have a semicolon at the end of that line. And that semicolon is going to indicate a complete change, a complete shift when we go to the next line. Because now it tells us about the people who haven't made it. 
40 gone down together. Gone down, um, well, it can be literal in the sense that they've gone down into the sea, but it could also be a euphemism because they have died. Um, they went down together. They all went the same way. They all drowned. Um, and it's sort of this question after the first line, like, why is there so much glee if 40 have gone down together, if 40 have died? But as we discussed that contradiction earlier of this happiness that the storm is over and some people have survived, but there has been this great tragic loss as well. Into the boiling sand. Notice the enjambment on those lines, enjambment, the run on lines. So 40 gone down together into the boiling sand. It could fit on one line as one sentence or one um, clause and it's, it's been split up here over two lines and that enjambment emphasizes how the sea took them quickly without any hesitation. Into the boiling sand, this is a metaphor obviously, right? There's not actually boiling sand. But if you think of boiling, if you think of like a kettle boiling, it bubbles up really violently. And so this is a metaphor for the rough sea, which has sort of like been, looks like it's boiling, it's bubbling, it's making these big waves. And this image of sand, it's almost like quicksand, like it's taking all these people as they, uh, as the ship is being destroyed, it is like um, sort of the sea is opening up and it's bubbling and it's taking all these people down with it and it's almost like it's seizing the bodies to the bottom of the sea ring for the scant salvation toll for the bonny souls neighbor and friend and bridegroom spinning upon the shoals so we continue on and we're still being very um sad and very somber um in this in this in the stanza just like the first stanza we're going to see there's a little bit of a shift later on in the poem we actually are in the moment in the first two stanzas where it's actually happening the storm has happened and now we're dealing with the repercussions whereas later on in the poem we're going to see how the story has become a sort of legend which is told for children ring um so in those days remember we're talking about the 1800s the 1800s is when this poem has been written um so you would ring the church bells to get the town's attention, right? Because obviously technology was very different at that time. So in order to get people's attention, you would ring the bell and everyone would know that something, you know, was wrong then and they would come and try and help. So they ring the bell to get everyone's attention. For the scant salvation, scant means few or scarce salvation, been saved. The few that have been saved, they need people to come and help them, to come and make sure that they're all right toll for the bonny souls now this toll can be referred to two different things so we know we use the word toll when we talk about like the death toll and we're talking about the souls that didn't make it here the reference to souls indicates that they are no longer with us that they have died but it can also mean another instruction like ring to ring the bell the the bell must toll the toll is the ring of the bell and perhaps the ring of the bell is commemorating the dead for the bonny souls, bonny means beautiful, the beloved. So perhaps the church bells are providing, you know, a sense of remembrance to these souls. And if we look over here at the dash, the dash is really significant because a dash indicates an explanation or an elaboration that is following. So now we're getting more information about who these souls were and it makes it all the more emphatic and all the more depressing and traumatic once we find out who these people are these are not just random people to the speaker neighbor and friend and bridegroom so neighbor these this is happening like in the speaker's town she knows these people to friend bridegroom even more um emphatic because a bridegroom is someone well it's the groom so they're about to start this new life um, and this has been tragically cut short. So members of the community, the speaker knows these people and emphasizes the tragic feelings and consequences of the shipwreck. Spinning upon the shoals. This spinning, this participle, the ing, um, it indicates this continuation of suffering for the dead as the dying and dying as the people are watching, like spinning upon the shoals. It's almost like maybe their death wasn't so sudden. Maybe it was... Um, you know, long lived that they were suffering, but also the people watching are um, the people who have survived or the people who are just on land. They're watching this and they're seeing this tragedy unfold. Um, so the speaker in the community are watching helplessly as the dead continue to spin upon the shores. The shores are shallow water, 
So it's almost like these people are, are getting even more traumatized, not just losing these people, but they can actually see their bodies on the water. And it makes it all the more tragic because there's this ship seems to have been close to the shore, yet 40 of them died. They couldn't be rescued. That's the power of nature. And that exclamation mark, once again, is really just emphasizing the drama, emphasizing the trauma of this event. Moving on to stanza three, now we have a little bit of a shift. So we're no longer in the moment when the shipwreck is happening. Now we're talking about how the shipwreck is going to be remembered and how it, the tale is going to be told to children. How to sort of deal with this tragedy, the aftermath of it. How will they tell the shipwreck when winter shakes the door till the children ask, but the 40, do they come back no more? So how will they tell the shipwreck? How can this horrible and horrendous story ever be recounted? When winter shakes the door, this is personification. This emphasizes the power of nature because winter does not really have the ability to shake the door, right? That is a human quality that we were able to do that. And so winter is a symbol of the storm and the stormy conditions. And what is winter? If we think of the connotations of winter, we think of a storm, we think something threatening. We think of nature being powerful. So the question is asked here, well, when these stormy conditions come back to town, when they're shaking our door, when they're threatening to have another tragic storm, what are we going to tell the children? Door, if we think about a door and what a door does, it's put into place for protection. And so the question is asked now, what are we going to do when our protection and our safety is threatened again when winter comes? Because as winter comes, it's going to be reminding the community of the storm that caused this terrible shipwreck. Till the children ask. If you think about children, we think innocent, we think naive. Maybe these children were too young. Maybe they were not there even when the shipwreck happened. And now they want to know what actually happened um, during this moment. Why perhaps all the adults are fearful when winter shakes the door. But the 40, the question mark, the children ask to know literally like what actually happened to those 40 people. And the question mark emphasizes the sense of helplessness and disbelief of the people. There's been so much tragedy that has occurred and of such a magnitude, this tragedy has been truly um, impressive in size. It's been so immense. Did they come back no more? So we see two question marks there and that's, you know, really emphasizes the um, the tragedy and sort of like, you know, when you have such a tragedy, you ask all these questions because it doesn't seem real. Will they ever come back? They are, the children ask, emphasizes the finality of the tragedy. They're lost forevermore. Also notice the use of inverted commas here. This makes it really conversational and really authentic because um, there's this direct connection. We can actually hear the exact words that the children are asking. So it's really making it all the more vivid and all the more real for us as the readers. Our final stanza. Then a silence suffuses the story and a softness the teller's eyes. And the children know for further question and only the waves reply. What a powerful and um, impactful end to this, to this poem. And so after the children ask that question in stanza three, then a silence suffuses the story suffuses is like it gradually spreads and we can notice the alliteration of the s sound there the sibilance or the sibilant sound it's almost like mimics this whisper sound the whisper the, the sort of the silence is um dispersing throughout the room as the adults quiet down because no adult wants to break the terrible news of the 40 deaths who the people the souls who will never return and so this alliteration, the sibilance emphasizes the sadness and also the slow realization of the children as suddenly every, all the adults go quiet. And a softness, the teller's eyes. So maybe a tear comes to the teller's eyes. We don't know his or her. We don't know really who the teller is, but maybe tears and softness in their eyes. Maybe they start to tear up. And the children, no further question. So children... Um, the children become intuitive. They recognize the silence of the adults. They understand why the adults have fallen silent. I think that's something perhaps that children do often that maybe adults we don't realize. 
but they are very in tune with what adults are feeling. They can read those nonverbal cues and they can read this as the adults go silent. They can recognize what has actually happened. No one needs to tell them. They can recognize that this tragedy occurred, that these souls cannot be recovered and how the adults in the community are still dealing with that pain. Then no further question. They're not going to ask again. And only the waves reply. Nothing that the children or adults can do or say can make it bearable. The waves have the last word. Nature is powerful. It's such a terrible tragedy that adults don't even try and make sense of it or come up with something for the children. That's how deep of a tragedy it is. And the fact that it ends with the waves replying that the waves have the last word, it really emphasizes that theme we spoke about right at the beginning, that nature ultimately can overpower humanity, that nature is the real superior being. Notice the anaphora, our last three lines here, anaphora, the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines. And this emphasizes the continuing sadness of the tragedy. It doesn't get better with the retelling. It's still heartbreaking. The structure of our poem, stanza one and two is how, what's actually happening with the shipwreck. And stanza three and four is how it will be remembered and retold. We have a rhyme scheme in this poem. So in the first stanza, it's A, B, A, B. And then continuing on, the second and the fourth lines of each stanza rhyme. Um, and that rhyme scheme is really effective in terms of showing us how this story has become sort of a legend or um, a myth. Not a myth per se, but a legend or a story that's been told to generations. It almost has that fable-like quality. Like, this is a story, this is a reminder of the tragedy that happened, but also perhaps if you read deeper on the power of nature and how we must always recognize how nature is ultimately, can ultimately overpower human beings. The tone at different times, it's sort of a different tone. So understand which lines the question is referring to and then you can answer the tone question. Earnest, solemn, despairing, sorrowful, disheartening, depressing, introspective, reflective and somber at times optimistic, like the first two lines is are quite optimistic, so it really depends on where you are in the poem. The mood is somber and reflective, slightly joyful at the start, but then it becomes more somber and reflective. The theme of the message, grief, the power of nature, tragedy, and the effects of tragedy, dealing with the tragedy. Um, and perhaps even a sense of recognizing silver linings but understanding the extent of a tragedy, and in this case, the tragedy attributed to nature. I hope that you found that video helpful. Please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello, and welcome to another Chai Tutors video. In today's video, we're going to be unpacking the poem, Poem of Return by Geoffrey Rocher. So as always, we'll start with um, some information about our poet because understanding the context of the poem is absolutely critical to understanding the intended message and the background. So unfortunately I couldn't find a lot of information about this poet. So Geoffrey Russia was born in 1941. His real name is Roberto Francisco de Almeida. He is an Angolan politician and what's really important to understand is the context of this poem. So if we think about Angolan history, Angola was colonized by the Portuguese and then during the 1960s when a lot of other African countries were gaining their independence, um, some African countries were um, given their independence in a more peaceful manner and other countries had to really fight for the independence and Angola was one of those um, countries who really had to fight the Portuguese. So they're engaged in this in war of independence from 1961 until 1974 and in 1974 or 1975, um, the Portuguese finally leave and Angola is declared independent, but then it launches into a civil war, which is a civil war between people of the same country from 1975 all the way up until 2002. And this civil war um, is a result of the war in independence in the sense that the Angolan people join together to fight against the oppressors, against the colonizers, the Portuguese, and then during the civil war, 
we have all these different groups turning on each other. So Roberto Francisco de Almeida, he is part of the MPLA, which is one of the sort of parties, one of the sort of freedom movements. He was exiled and he spent some time in jail. And so this poem, we can understand it in terms of him returning from exile or even just a general idea. We don't necessarily know that it's about him per se, but it could be about any speaker. Because during this time, when there's a war happening, there are lots of people that are often sent into exile, meaning that they are you know, forced to go away from their, from their home countries for reasons usually pertaining to their safety. Um, but being in that space, being in exile away from your country during a really difficult time when your country is going through war, when your country is going through something difficult is often very challenging as one could imagine um you're away from your family you don't have any communication and you're also not there to um you're also not there to experience the highs and lows with your people and so this poem we're going to see this is a the speaker is someone who has been in exile or who is currently in exile and he is dreaming of coming home not necessarily dreaming but he is anticipating coming home and he wants a certain homecoming which is different from what perhaps one would expect um, in terms of he does not see himself as a hero he wants to be brought into the fold he doesn't want to be isolated anymore he wants to understand what his people have been going through so I hope that gives you a little bit of context before we actually get into the poem in terms of Angolan history in terms of what it means to be in exile etc So if we look at the title, Poem of Return, it's very focused on the return, it's not focused on the exile itself, which makes a lot of sense because it is emphasising, throughout the poem we're going to see him emphasising not his own struggles and what he's been through, but when he returns he wants to hear about all the struggles of his people while he's been gone. When I return from the land of exile and silence, do not bring me flowers. So we start off with this stanza which sort of gives us an understanding of the entire poem to come. He says when, um, and this indicates that he's thinking optimistically, right? It's not if I will return, it's when I will return. Um, so he's thinking positively, he will return. He doesn't know when exactly, but he knows that he will. From the land of exile and silence. Land of exile, this is a foreign place which is devoid of communication, devoid of family, it's isolated, he has no news of home, and that's the idea of the silence. He's been exiled from his country, and he doesn't even know what's going on in his country. So notice how he does admit to have experienced suffering in this land of exile and silence, but he's going to realize that his plight, his suffering, is far is largely insignificant compared to those who stayed behind and fought. He says, do not bring me flowers. This is very commanding. He starts with a verb, the imperative. He commands the listeners, do not bring me flowers. If we think about what flowers are, flowers are a symbol of perhaps celebration. They're used to welcome the homecoming of a hero. The speaker does not want this custom to be applied to him. He does not think of himself as a hero. And perhaps he feels slightly guilty for being away or he doesn't feel like he should be as appreciated as he might be when he returns home. Bring me rather all the dews, tears of dawns which witness dramas. Bring me the immense hunger for love and the plaint of tumid sexes and star-studded night. Bring me the long night of sleeplessness and mother's mourning, their arms bereft of sons. So he's told us he doesn't want flowers, but now he explains what he does want. Notice the repetition of bring me, bring me and bring me. Um, I wouldn't call it anaphora because it anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of subsequent lines or clauses and here we have a little bit of a break but it is repetition um, so he is being sort of commanding or you know being very direct in terms of what he wants what does he want rather rather meaning like in replacement of the flowers he wants all the dews this is an example of hyperbole dew is the droplets of moisture that you see on the ground in the early morning it is absolutely impossible to go and collect all these little droplets of water um, he also says tears of dawn. Think about tears and dews. They're both water-based, um, what should we say, water-based things. And if you think about trying to collect water, think about like putting water in your hand, it's difficult to collect tears 
and Jews, they represent the tales and the stories which he's missed out on, the stories of the real heroes who have stayed behind, and it's difficult to collect all the different ones. So he's really praising his fellow countrymen because they have all experienced this loss and he recognizes that he recognizes that he's not the only one to experience suffering that the people who stayed behind may have experienced even more suffering um tears have a connotation of tragedy and he wants the tears of dawns which witness dramas and here we have an example of personification because the dawn is being personified that the dawn has witnessed these dramas that has been born witness to what's happened and this really emphasizes, remember, if we use personification, it always creates a sense of power, that this um, concept now has power because it has the, you know, it has these human qualities. And it's almost like the dawn is now given the power to be horrified at what it sees before it. If we think of the word dramas, I think it's um, a bit of an interesting word to use, because if you think of a drama, um, the drama, like a drama is sort of theatrical so it's almost as though the speaker has been away for so long it's as if the stories have become um have been crafted into dramatic tales of heroism um not just sort of like these big tragedies but it's almost like this drama that that's how extreme he thinks that these people who have stayed behind their experiences have been crafted into this sort of story-like thing or this legend this drama I think also it's effective in terms of the use of the word drama because it serves as this alliteration. We have dawns and dramas, the repetition of the D sound, and that's a really harsh sound and it emphasizes the aggression of these crimes. The dawn has witnessed these terrible, terrible things. If we think of dawn, it's an interesting one because dawn is usually a beautiful time of day. Well, that's how I would typically characterize dawn. It's sort of like a new day, new promise. Um, and if we think about, like, in terms of the times of the day where we have terrible things that happen, it would be the night. And by the time dawn comes, then, you know, that struggle is over or theoretically the tragedy is ended. But by using that, the dawns are witnessing these dramas. It's almost like the dramas do not end at night. There is this continuation of struggle, even in the dawn, even during the early morning. You, um, the, there's this, these horrifying events that are taking place. And the fact that the dawn witnesses it just sort of also indicates that sort of helplessness that the country has had to see its people suffer so terribly. Bring me, repeated, the immense hunger for love. He wants immense means great hunger implies this yearning or this desperateness for love. He wants human connection. Remember, if he's in exile, he's isolated from everyone he wants the love of the of the people of his of his fellow countrymen he wants this human connection and the plaint of tumid sexes in star-studded night and plaint is like a plea or a lamentation and tumid means swollen so he longs for romance and intimacy he longs to be with his people he longs to have the sense of human connection on this very intimate level and I think you can see this in refer reference to his love for his countrymen, but also maybe his love for his country. He wants to be immersed in his country again. He wants to be there. He wants to experience the pain alongside his fellow his fellow people. And he wants to feel that connection to them. Star studded night. If you think of star studded night, it is associated with romance and intimacy. It's a romantic thing, you know, to go and witness the star studded night. But I think also if we think about this this speaker being in exile being away from home if we think about africa we always think of that star studded night we think of the beautiful african sky that's what it's known for and so he wants to be immersed in his country bring me the long night of sleeplessness with mother's mourning their arms bereft of sons so another request that he has he wants to bring him the long night of sleeplessness notice that this long this is this this their suffering is long lasting but also notice the singular use of night he doesn't say bring me the long nights of sleeplessness i mean he has plural mothers my mothers are mourning their sons but he doesn't say that there's long nights of sleeplessness he says there's one singular night and it's almost like all their individual pain has been morphed into one nationalistic and unified um, sense of struggle so within um horror the horror of war um you have a sense of community in terms of all your suffering becomes one and it becomes this long night of suffering of sleeplessness when you can't sleep you're restless you can't come to terms with something 
Notice the enjambment in these lines, um, sleeplessness with mothers. That enjambment emphasizes the continuation they're suffering. Remember, enjambment is when the line doesn't end on a punctuation mark. It sort of continues as the run on lines into the next line. With mother's mourning, the alliteration there, the repetition of the M sound, emphasizes this troubling mood. I think it's really interesting that he's, he's used mothers and sons because I sort of think of this poem in reference to um, war poetry. If you think about war poetry, you know, there's often that imagery of mothers mourning their sons and wives mourning their husbands and children mourning their fathers. And that's all really like emphatic and relevant. But the fact that it's just reference to mothers and sons, yeah, not wives or daughters or husbands, I think it serves to emphasize how young and innocent and heroic the dead are. So the people who have died for their country, in this case, these are sons. And so by seeing them as sons, we're seeing them as maybe more vulnerable and maybe their sacrifice being all the more extreme because they're seen as children. Their arms bereft of sons, bereft meaning deprived or lacking. They're left without their sons who have been killed, fighting, exiled or imprisoned. And um, my assumption is that this poem is with regard to the war of independence um, because that would make sense for someone to be exiled during that war and for so many lives to have been lost in this fight against colonialism. When I return from the land of exile and silence, no, do not bring me flowers. Bring me only just this, la the last wish of heroes fallen at daybreak, with a wingless stone in hand and a thread of anger snaking from their eyes. There should be a full stop at the end there. I'm sorry, I didn't put the full stop on the slide for some reason. So when I return from the land of exile and silence, here's repetition. And he uses a, now he adds in the word no before he says do not. And this emphasizes this forceful tone. It emphasizes his resistance of being treated like a hero. He does not want to be treated like a hero at all. He says do not bring me flowers. And then we have this ellipsis, the three dots. And this leaves out why. And I think that maybe this is sort of, um, I mean, it could be a reference to the fact that maybe this poem is longer. But if we just see it in terms of, um, you know, as a poetic device, it's almost like we should focus on what, on how we should honor the people who have fallen, not focusing on my struggles and my plight. Um, but as I said, I don't know if this is left out information, but it could also refer to the sense of um, him saying that he wants to focus on the plight of others. He says, don't bring me flowers. He's not going to get into his whole tale. Let's rather continue on what you should bring me and why, what we should be um, respecting, or what we should be focusing on. Bring me only just. Only and just mean the same thing. So using them next to each other is a form of redundancy. And it just really emphasizes that he only wants one thing. That's the only thing he requires. He wants the last wish of heroes. Think about what we said about night being singular. Here, once again, we have the singular, the last wish of many heroes. They all have a singular desire, and that is a free country. And these heroes fallen at daybreak, these heroes who have fallen, this is a euphemism, right? Because it is saying something unpleasant in a more pleasant way that they've fallen, where actually we know that they've died or been killed in a you know dramatic fashion at daybreak. Once again, a reference to dawn. And if we think about you know what dawn can represent or what daybreak can represent it's sort of like these men were at the start of their lives if you think to war poetry that's also a common thread in war poetry that we see it's almost like these young men were on the brink of something exceptional they were on the brink of you know finding or starting their their lives these are young people with promise with dreams and this is this lost opportunity that they can't live out their future it could also refer to maybe a daybreak if you think about it's like just as the tide is turning, just as nighttime is ending and there's morning and there's some sort of hope, then these men die. So it's like the speaker is trying to um, to trying to honor these these men who fought um, and who died, whether it's at the start of their lives or um, with the end in sight and they still had to sacrifice their lives. With a wingless stone in hand, this is a bit of a strange imagery. Um, and I think a wingless stone is, yeah, it is quite a strange image to think about. But if 
it's a wingless stone, it means it hasn't been thrown. So almost think of like, you know, skipping stones on a river. And if you're if the stone is wingless, it's almost like it hasn't set flight yet, it hasn't been thrown. So perhaps this indicates, and we're going to read on to the next line before I explain this, and a thread of anger sneaking from their eyes. So if you think of a thread of anger, anger, what's this anger could be cast towards is this, you know, anger and, um, you know, confrontation, violence towards the colonial government and their actions, the colonial empire, which caused their deaths and the deaths of so many others, which spark more anger. And if you think about that, it's quite an interesting cycle. So the deaths, um, so people would fight against the colonial empire, right, because they were angry at what they were doing. And then when the colonial government retaliates or kills those people, then there's even more anger amongst amongst African people to, to fight back. So that anger can refer to that. And the thread of anger snaking from their eyes is in itself an interesting concept because a thread is something thin, but a thread is like, if you think of your clothes, it's everywhere, all over your clothes. It's sort of like within every molecule or with every aspect of your essence. And snaking has really da dangerous connotations, right? You think of a snake, you think of something volatile and dangerous. It shows that the anger is deep and threaded through them. So these men who have died have this, and if you think of eyes as well, eyes are your window to your soul. It's sort of, they have this intent, they have this angry intent. They have this a desire to fight for themselves, to fight for their country. And that can go back to the winged stone. It's almost like this intended violence has maybe not been committed. They weren't able to express their anger in as much as how extreme it was before they were killed. They had so much anger and it didn't even it didn't even like get to play out. Um, but it could also refer to something a little more um, subtle. Maybe they had so much to give the world, but their stone is uncast due to their violent deaths. So just like we spoke about at daybreak, like how tragic their deaths are, this wingless stone, that they had all of this to give, but they were not able to cast their stone. So sort of two different interpretations of that image. If we look at the structure, there's lots of repetition. So that emphasizes that this is a really authentic plea. Lots of enjambment, the continuation of the plight of the struggle, Free verse once again emphasizes how it's sincere and authentic. The theme and the message, exile, fighting for freedom and the dangers or consequences, anger, the cost of war, grief and isolation. The tone is different at different times, so pick and choose the correct word according to the line that you are referencing. Demanding, angry, somber, melancholic, ardent, impassioned and earnest. Ardent, passion, earnest, similar words meaning like very passionate, um, very sort of motivated or enthused to say what you want to say. The mood is somber and serious. I hope that you found that video helpful and has given you a little bit more information about the poem. Um, I hope that you will like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to another Chai Cheetah video. In today's video, we're going to be analysing the poem This Winter Coming by Karen Press. So as always, we'll start with a little analysis of our poet so that we can understand the context and the framing behind this poem. Karen Press is a South African poet, writer and translator who was born in 1956 and she's published short stories, poetry collections and even a film script. And this leads us to our discussion of the context of this particular poem, which I would highly recommend you read more about. I'm just going to sort of try and summarize it into a few sentences for you, but there's a lot of information out there and I would definitely recommend that you research it, not just for the purposes of this poem, but also just for the purposes of having an understanding of South Africa's history. So this poem was published in 1986 and the 1980s in South Africa was a very tumultuous period. Obviously, um, apartheid was, well, the apartheid government was in control of South Africa, but we were, it was very, very close to democracy because democracy came in 1994. So the 1980s had a direct effect on the creation of the new South Africa. But during the 1980s, there was a lot of resistance against the apartheid government, but there was also a lot of retaliation. So there was increased resistance, but there was also increased oppression. There were reforms that were being created, but there was a lot of violence and it was a very eventful period. 
And all of these different contending forces really resulted in this period of uncertainty. And that's what this poem is really focusing on, this theme of uncertainty that is created by the resistance movements and the apartheid government sort of, um, you know, colliding at once in the 1980s, both really powerful forces um, during this period, and it really created an eventful, an eventful decade. Um, and that uncertainty is the major theme of this poem. So if we look at our title, This Winter Coming, we start off with a demonstrative pronoun. A demonstrative pronoun are words such as this, that, these, and those. And what they do is they really make something focused or specific. So it's not just a winter coming or the winter coming even, not even using those articles, but this winter coming, it really makes it important and significant. The use of winter, as we're going to see, we can read this poem in a literal and a figurative way. So literally, if we think about the connotations of winter, um, we think of negative, icy, dangerous conditions, right? When winter is coming, if you think of it like animals even, they go into hibernation or they have to, you know, collect resources. When we go into winter, it's the same sort of thing. There's this like level of fear that we need to prepare for this danger that's coming up ahead. And so we can think about with this as, you know, a literal poem as the winter is coming and people are feeling uncertain and feeling unprepared. But really, we have to also understand this poem in a figurative aspect. And this winter is representative of this increased oppression, increased resistance, resulting in this period of uncertainty. Um, coming, as we can see here, the ING, and the ING really creates the sense of immediacy. Um, it's like coming, it's approaching, it's like, you know, almost engulfing us. We're, as we're going to see throughout the poem, the, the poet or the speaker speaks about being, you know, almost in, not in the middle yet, but having this period of uncertainty already has begun. And this winter coming is going to come and sort of engulf everyone. So it's a sense of immediacy. And this, this title in general provides this um, ominous, foreboding mood and tone that we're going to come to recognize comes throughout this poem and every single stanza we have that foreboding, ominous feeling. It sort of makes us feel that way. Um, so that's our title. Now let's get into these actual stanzas, the actual poem itself. Walking in the thick rain of this winter, we have only just entered. Who is not frightened? Okay, so stanza one, a really interesting stanza, setting the, see, the scene up for us. Um, if we look, we start off, we don't start with a capital letter, which of course as an English teacher sometimes drives me mad, but this is being used intentionally, right? Because do you see, once again, the use of the ing, the use of the participle is showing that we are already in that space. We're sort of like in the winter already. We've just entered it and now we're walking more and more towards it. And obviously winter here is functioning, as they said, a metaphor of uncertainty, we're walking deeper into this despairing sort of energy. Walking in the thick rain. It is quite interesting because um, I'm no weather expert, but geographically in South Africa, the you know rain is usually a summertime thing, except perhaps in the Western Cape. Um, so it is interesting, and I think perhaps maybe it's reading too much into it, but it's really the fact that we're expecting rain and winter, it's just really emphasizing how dangerous this uncertainty is or how scary and fearful the speaker is feeling because we've got the winter and we've got the rain. And the rain is obviously significant because here it's, it's described as thick rain. It's heavy and dense. It's filled with despair. And negativity. Um, so starting with a lowercase letter and the ing participle, the winter has already started and we are in the mists or the middle of it. Of this winter we have only just entered. So we've already started this period of struggle. I also want to just talk about winter and I could have spoken about it in the title but we can speak about it now as well. But if we think about winter we spoke about you know the fact that it has this ominous nature and that it's sort of threatening and has these connotations of danger. But it's important to remember as well is that winter is a season and so ultimately it will pass. So the speaker is talking about this period of distress and perhaps speaks to how change um, comes after a dark period of time. So she's talking about we are entering this sort of season of winter where, you know, in order for meaningful change to take place, maybe there needs to be some upheaval. Maybe there needs to be some sort of um, uncertainty in order for actually, you know, 
a positive outcome to happen, right? That's perhaps what she's thinking here. But putting it as a season is slightly more optimistic than maybe what the poem comes across, right? Because the poem comes across as something extremely sort of pessimistic or um, depressing or, you know, this thing of un this theme of uncertainty. But the fact that it's a season, she's saying winter, it's a season, it's going to end, there is going to be the summer that comes after it. We can understand that to be a slightly more optimistic thread to this argument. Notice the enjambment, so enjambment is the run on lines, and so you see here she doesn't like end on a full stop in the first line, and um, she's actually continuing the same sentence over two lines. And this enjambment goes throughout the poem, there's, there's numerous instances or examples of it, and this really emphasizes the continuation of winter, and it's that ing idea as well, that participle idea. It's like you're walking into winter, you're being absorbed by it, it's continuing on. And so that enjambment really emphasizes the continuation of winter and the, the, the distress of like, oh, it seems to go on and on and on. Who is not frightened? So this rhetorical question ends mostly every stanza in this poem, and so we can call it something called a refrain. Um, and you can think of it almost like a chorus in a song. And um, we'll discuss it later on when it's repeated, but just notice how this refrain is really adding to that fearful and scared tone and mood that we have of this poem. It's a rhetorical question, and that rhetorical question obviously engages with the reader and the audience. It really makes us feel even, it emphasizes how fearful we feel because we're now sort of drawn into it. And we ask this question and we need to imagine these circumstances for ourselves. The wording or the phrasing of the question um, assures you that you are frightened, that being frightened is the default. If you are not frightened, you are the exception. So it's not who is frightened, which is sort of implies that, okay, most people are fine and some people are frightened but who is not frightened this wording implies that by default you are frightened and if you're not frightened then well then you're the exception and that's strange so you can see this just adding to this mood of fear the sea is swollen churning in broken waves around the rocks the sand is sinking away the seagulls will not land under the sky the shroud falling who is not frightened. So stanza two, we start off with some natural imagery. And whenever we have natural imagery in poetry, um, I mean, we can always interpret it in the literal sense, right? If you have winter coming in here, the sort of description of nature implies, you know, a storm is approaching or some dangerous weather is approaching. So we can see that in a literal sense that, you know, we've got to get ready because this, um, this winter storm or this winter energy is coming forth and it's filled with negativity and you've got to do something about it. But when we look at na natural imagery figuratively, and I'm saying this in general because it's something you can think about applying to your unseen poetry analysis as well, is typically when everything is right and peaceful in nature, then it indicates a sort of peaceful tone or things or whatever is being figuratively associated is something positive. But here we can see that the sea is swollen, churning in broken waves. You can have lots of negative natural imagery, like nature is not at where it should be it's not at its peaceful point it's not something that's going it's not something positive that's going on and so there we can really understand the figurative energy we can understand the uncertainty like nature itself is bubbling with uncertainty and with fear at what's happening the c is swollen so there we have a sibilant alliteration the repetition of the s sound and this imitates or emphasizes the swelling of the ocean if you think of something being swollen, it has quite negative connotations, almost like it's filled with, you know, horrors of, the, of change or not change necessarily, but um, in this case with uncertainty, right? Churning in broken waves. Churning indicates this disruptive, uncomfortable, distressing idea. It's going to wreak, wreak havoc on everything in broken waves so we can see something is not right in nature it's violent and this reflects the figurative interpretation of the poem something is not right in south africa something's going on that needs to be changed or needs to be um settled around the rocks the sand is sinking away so around the rocks it's still going around, it's trying to knock them over to inspire some change. So we can see this as a, a bit of a metaphor. If you think about like the ocean coming over rocks, right? Rocks are sort of immovable. It's very difficult to move them. It's very, it was very difficult, if you think back to history, to 
upend the apartheid system. The apartheid system almost represents, the rocks almost represent the apartheid system. And the resistance movement is like the ocean coming to, to knock them down. But it takes years and years. It takes a lot of resistance for the water to actually come and completely take the rock away. The sand is sinking away. So here we have more sibilant illustration. Um, the rep repetition of the S sound, it emphasizes the sand is slinking and sinking, sort of like, I feel like you can think about an hourglass in this case, you know, like the sand slipping and it's almost like time is running out. There's, there's so much uncertainty. It's like, when is it going to sort of reach this climax and things are all going to go crazy? The sand is being, also you can think of the sand as being absorbed into the ocean um, and it's only a matter of time before the rocks are going to, you know, seed to the um, to the pressures of the ocean. So we can see in that way as well, like the little things, the sand, there are little things changing, right? Because during this period, there were little things changing, um, little sort of victories for the resistance movements. And so like the sand is being absorbed by the ocean. And so these little things have been, are being worked out. And so maybe these big things, the rocks, the big sort of um, policies of apartheid and the apartheid government itself is going to come. So soon the big things as well, the sand sinking also shows a lack of stability. There is a difficult winter coming up in the country. So we can sort of see this image in three different ways. So just to summarize, so we have the first D we said, it's like sort of like time running out. It's like this, this um, hourglass that's, you know, this, the sand is sinking. We can also see it in terms of um, in a positive way in the sense that the, if the ocean is representative of resistance and the rocks are representative of the apartheid government, the sand sinking way shows that the resistance movement is making progress. But we can also see it in the sense of if sand is sinking, right? Imagine you're standing on a beach or think of those like, you know, quicksand even. And if the sand is sinking and you feel like you're sinking, there's a lack of stability. You don't have any sort of ground to be on. And that really emphasizes the unpredictability and the uncertainty of this time period. The seagulls will not land. So if you think about what we said about nature, the seagulls not wanting to land, that's something, you know, they sense the danger. And this is something that really should be should be off-putting to, well, not off-putting, but should really emphasize um, the uncertainty and the, the despair of the situation if even seagulls don't want to land. Um, this could also, if we sort of analyze it deeper in terms of the figurative aspect of this poem, it could perhaps also refer to the sanctions and disinvestment in South Africa. So during the 1980s, um, international and foreign countries and companies didn't want to associate with South Africa because they recognized the um, racism and the oppression that was happening in the country. And so a lot of countries disinvested and they brought they they took their companies out of South Africa. A lot of them also, um, you know, a lot of countries put sanctions on South Africa. They weren't allowed to participate in certain events. It's like no one actually wants to be associated with South Africa. And so that's what the seagulls could represent. Um, the enjambment, once again, we see it here. And it's almost like the winter's climax is approaching. It's just there's momentum. The enjambment really emphasizes the momentum of what's happening and how we're going to reach this, you know, all this uncertainty, all this unpredictable, all the un unpredictable um, aspects sort of going to reach this climax, which could be potentially dangerous. Under this sky, this shroud falling. So under this sky, here we have the demonstrative again. The demonstrative um, really makes it real. It makes it right here in your face. Because if you think about demonstrative, if you even think of like the root of the word demonstrate, if you're demonstrating with something, you're like, you actually have the things with you. So it's like, this is that, that is this. And so um, here, using the demonstrative again, it makes it really real in our, in our face. This sky, this very sky, this shroud, a shroud covers and conceals, but often we use this as um, a sort of covering for a dead body. And so this imagery is significant because this winter that is coming is going to engulf us all. And the question is sort of, what will it cover? So perhaps this imagery signifies how the winter is a period of resistance, which will lead to the death of the apartheid regime and its oppressive policies. Perhaps we can see it in that positive way of the shroud being sort of this covering of the torturous and traumatic past of South Africa. And maybe this period of um, uncertainty is actually going to yield something more positive. But at the same time, it could be something negative, you know, even just associating a shroud death you know having that negative imagery and the following refrain or the following line which has the refrain who is not frightened 
it still has that air of negativity or uncertainty and worry and concern. So who is not frightened? Here we have this repeated refrain and it really emphasizes the melancholy and the melancholic tone. It's almost like a if you think of a repeated refrain, it could be like a cry of pain. It emphasizes the permeation of fear in the country. It's not just, you know, one person feeling frightened. It's everyone. And we spoke about the default of frightened in the first stanza when we had this refrain. In every part of the city, sad women climbing onto buses, dogs barking in the street, and the children in every doorway crying. The world is so hungry. Madam's house is clean. And the women return with slow steps to the children, the street, the sky tolling like a black bell. These women are a tide of sadness. They will drown the world. Who is not frightened? So our third stanza, a really detailed stanza. And in this stanza, we're really going to understand the theme of the disparity between the rich and the poor um, and under apartheid between the races. In every part of the city, um, in every single part of South Africa, there's the sense of inequality. The inequality is far reaching. It's not just concerned with one area or one group of people. It's everywhere. There's the sense of inequality, despair, disparity. Um, sad women climbing onto buses. So thinking about um, under apartheid, um, there were different places where different races could live. And so the city was typically reserved for white people. Um, but they had um, African people working in the white areas. And so this sort of line is indicating how these women who have been working in the cities during the daytime now have to climb on buses to go far away to go to where they're allowed to live under the apartheid um, laws. So that's why we have in every part of the city and now these sad women are climbing onto buses because they've done their work for the day. We're going to see later on that they're domestic workers and they are going to have to now go home to their own children far away from where they work. Sad, I think we're going to see lots of negative diction here. I'm just looking at the stanza. We have sad, we have crying, we have hungry. And that's really emphasizing the one aspect of, you know, the one class of people under apartheid is dealing with. And we're going to see the contrast versus the other people, the people, the white people and how they are treated and how they are living their lives and how they're feeling so we have this contrast um climbing onto buses notice the ing's again the participles this is consistently happening this is happening as sort of as the speaker is speaking this is happening dogs barking in the street so this is just a very much a typical sort of scene that we can see and the children in every doorway crying um Notice the enjambment. The enjambment really emphasizes the continuation of the pain of this winter. And also, interestingly, if you look at children, it's isolated by itself at the end of the line. It's almost in this vulnerable position. And that can emphasize, you know, children are a vulnerable member of society. And so here, they've been put at the end of the line. There's sort of no protection from the other words. So we can understand their vulnerable position. And we can say that they're crying, they're in distress. And if you think about children, they have a sort of understanding beyond what maybe adults think that they do. They have a sort of deeper understanding of the world. They can understand when something's not right, even if they can't actually verbalize this fear or this uncertainty that adults can um, actually verbalize. Children can feel that uncertainty and they can, you know, they're crying. They're clearly in distress. They can understand something's not quite right in South Africa, not quite right in their world. The world is so hungry. Madam's house is clean. This is a really interesting line to analyze because we've had all this in German. So we've had this all like separation of lines. And now we have this line which doesn't seem to connect because we have complete, two completely different things going on in this line separated by the comma. The world is so hungry. The so is really used for emphasis and hungry. We can think about this literally or we can think about it figuratively because so many people in South Africa at this time and sadly today even are hungry they don't have food but we can also think about it as hungry in terms of something's missing that the country is devoid of something it's devoid of equality it's devoid of humanity and then we have this dichotomy or this contrast because we have the world is so hungry and world we can think about that as a contrast to the city because it's the sense of the world this entire sort of understanding of the country 
um, or the, the struggle is so far reaching that it's almost like the entire world of these people is crumbling. And then we have that dichotomy, that contrast to Madam's house is clean. Madam, if you think about Madam, it's singular. Um, this title is also a sound, a, oh, sorry, a sign of power and respect and hierarchy. So we can understand the contrast between and the disparity between the life of the domestic workers whose world is so hungry, whose entire existence is devoid of so much because they have been granted very little and the party government has oppressed and taken away so much versus the madam's house singular which shows how the apartheid system is benefiting the few over the many and how you know there's this distinct sign of hierarchy going on um so madam's house is clean so we can just see the complete contrast of these two ideas we have the hungry world of the domestic workers and then we have madam's house is clean which is almost like an added benefit if you can actually have food and then you can have also a clean house but it also signifies the role of these women as domestic workers because they clean the house and the women return with slow steps so these women the domestic workers they return they go back to their to their own homes and to their own children with slow steps that sibilant alliteration once again mimics the heaviness of their footsteps they have the slow pace as they walk they are exhausted we're going to see that later on as well there's the sense of exhaustion to the children the street the sky tolling like a black bell so the 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 this listing really emphasizes their exhaustion if you think about when you know even when you're tired you start listing all the different things that you have to do and so the 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 is really emphasizing how much or how exhausted and how tired they are and they're going back to their own children now to their own streets the sky above them it's almost like this um heavenly or spirit not spiritual necessarily but like this powerful presence over them is telling like a black bell black bell alliteration that harsh b sound emphasizing the sort of terrible situation that they're in this sort of really oppressive um and the black bell tolling is sort of like a signifier once again of time running out things happening despair being marked and then we have the um semicolon and so now we're going to see we have something we're going to have a, a comment so earlier on we've had this description of what's happening and now the semicolon indicates a separation and now we're going to get into a commentary on what's just happened these women are a tide of sadness. So here is a metaphor. Um, the tide refers back to that natural image earlier of the sea churning. Also notice, um, if you think of a tide, it's a sense of overwhelming. You think about like a tidal wave or a tide coming in the ocean. It's really overwhelming. They are so sad that the sadness has turned into despondency almost. I think it's also interesting that this speaker has used the, used the word sad because obviously when we're analyzing poetry we're looking at so every single word every single punctuation mark and the wording and the diction is so important and theoretically there are many synonyms for sad right we could use many many more fancy words for sad but she's used sad and sadness in the stanza and that simple word a simple emotion it's so it becomes so profound because she's used such a simple word and it can it's really appropriate in this case you know it's not the sense of anyone's being dramatic it's not like oh they're despondent or they're um sort of traumatized even the use of the sad just makes it it just emphasizes how they're not being dramatic it's not for show it's just this intense depressive sadness that that overwhelms them it's this they're just ostensibly sad there's there's nowhere else there's no um other way to almost say it in the sense that it's just such a deep profound sadness that has been elicited as a result of their of their distress and their circumstance they will drown the world so here we have more water imagery again so we had the tide we had now drowning and this sense of this in this sadness is so so desperate it's going to drown the entire world so notice the hyperbole here which emphasizes the sadness obviously no amount of sadness or no one can really drown the world per se so this hyperbole is used for emphasis um it's also the allusion to the earlier um statement we had obviously the churning and the broken waves but we also had 
the shroud, which is the sense of concealment. And so if you drown something, you are concealing it. And if you think about where the world was used earlier in this poem, it was used, the world is so hungry. And so they're trying to sort of, there's the sense of concealment of the pain and, and of, the, of the issues. Who is not frightened? Here's our repetition of the refrain, once again for emphasis. So just notice as we go through the poem, each stanza is linked by the refrain. And it's almost each stanza is referencing a different part of society or a different element of the struggle. And it's almost like whoever you are, or whatever the issue is, you are frightened of this upheaval. You are worrying about this extended metaphor of the, of the winter. You are worrying about this uncertainty ahead. On every corner, men standing, old stumps in the rain, tombstones engraved with open eyes, watching the bright cars full of sated faces, past them, past them, past them, who is not frightened. All right, so in this stanza, we are now going to focus on the men. In the previous stanza, we're focusing on the women. Now we're focusing on the men and their despairing situation. On every corner, every emphasizes how widespread this issue is. It's not just one man who's struggling every single corner. There are men standing. Um, and so we can think of these men as beggars or men looking for work. There's this sense of there's no opportunity left. There's nothing that they can do to, to solve the situation except stand on the corner and hope for someone to offer them a job or offer them um compensation i think it's interesting it doesn't specify the age of the men and then in the next line they are compared to old stumps in the rain and so it's almost like this generalization of all of these men no matter how old or how young they are are so despondent and are in such a terrible situation that they all seem like old stumps so this is a metaphor if you think of a tree stump a tree stump is old it's knocked down there's this attempt of it being destroyed it's a really dehumanizing metaphor if you're comparing someone to an old stump because a stump is what's left over sort of after the tree has been cut down and so it's not an image of opportunity it's not associated with anything with anything good it's almost just been just left behind in the rain the image of the rain again i think we just really emphasizes the sort of enveloping nature of winter how it completely sort of engulfs every person and um, the sense of uncertainty tombstones engraved with open eyes once again notice the enjambment that the use of tombstones implies that they're already dead in some capacity because you put a tombstone on a grave site where someone has died so it's almost like these men these their opportunities have have died they are lost they don't have a sort of direction to attain life or opportunity again engraved with open eyes if something's engraved, it's set in stone. It's almost set in stone now that their lives are over. And which really emphasizes the sense of helplessness, that there's this intense sense of pessimism, that this lack of opportunity and this lack of light in their lives cannot be reversed, it cannot be changed. Um, and so we can see here in this in this stanza, the men are sort of unmoving. There's no opportunity, they're incredibly despondent. The women are moving in the previous stanza there's this tide um, but what's sort of moving is the sadness because it's the tide of sadness and then so we have this contrast between the women and the men but ultimately both are traumatic and despairing situations and circumstances with open eyes and so this is the sort of contrast because you have the tombstones engraved and then now open eyes sort of is like hold on maybe they're actually alive but they are even more desperate and sad because they've been watching their lives sort of derail and fall apart. They don't have rights. They need to fight for everything in their lives. And they are fighting against these people. And who are these people? Going to the next line. The bright cars full of sated faces. This complete disparity. This white upper class that is completely does not understand their circumstances and is also not willing to help. They are watching the bright cars. Look at the diction here that is used. Bright and sated, full. This is positive diction. It's showing this completely um, different, this complete contrast to what we've just described about the men standing on the corner. 
Um, full is the sense of abundance. Sated means satisfied. So it's this contrast, completely different frame of reference or circumstance or situation. And now we have this line, which is past them, past them, past them. Notice the exclusive pronoun of them. Exclusive meaning it does not include um, the speaker or it does not include the men. So them, you can think of the difference between the, you know us versus them. It emphasizes this distinction, this disparity, this difference between the people in the cast versus the people in the corner. Um, the fact that it's repeated just emphasizes how many people pass them by and don't alleviate their plight. It reinforces the uncaring attitude that is effervescent in the 1980s in the country. The enjambment of this poem really emphasizes also the continuation of these men's plight of their struggle. Who is not frightened? Once again, our refrain. Into the rain, the children are running. Thin as the barest twigs, they kindle a fire to fight the winter. The bare bodies of raging fire of dead children and the sky collapsing under centuries of rain. The wind like a mountain crying, who is not frightened of this winter coming upon us now? So this last stanza, a really powerful stanza. Into the rain and children, the children are running. So into the rain, once again, that sense of the winter is engulfing everyone. They're in the midst of this winter already. The children, we think of connotations of children, innocent, vulnerable. They're running. And this is a very sort of different approach to the adults, right? We've seen the women sort of walking slowly we've seen the men standing still the women are and and the children i mean are running are they running out of fear are they running out of sort of fun they don't know what's going on that's a sort of question to ask yourself thin as the barest twigs they kindle a fire so here we have a simile they are so thin and we can think of these you know if we want a different word for thin you can think malnourished emaciated um, and this simile just really emphasizes how hungry they are, how thin they are. Um, thin is the barest twigs. If you think of a twig, it's really, really tiny. It's really, really thin. And barest, it's like totally naked. And it really emphasizes the sort of exposed and vulnerable nature of these children. This, they're not in a protected scenario at all. Um, based on you know, the fact that they're so thin, they, they really don't have much protection against the winter. They kindle a fire to fight the winter. The alliteration of the F sound imitates the ferocity of the fire, the, the, the fire sort of burning, the flames, to fight the winter. So the winter, as we spoke about, the winter is representative of this uncertainty. And this winter is so threatening, it's so dangerous. And what it represents, that it must be fought. The bare bodies a raging fire of dead children. The bare bodies, notice the BB alliteration, it emphasizes the vulnerability of the children and bare linking to bare, it's linking to the sort of exposed nature of the children. A raging fire. Now, if you think of raging, raging is a really violent word. There's a sense of urgency, right? If there's a raging fire, you have to do something, you have to go and, and fight it. Notice fire is repeated, so it's this repeated symbol. And what does fire represent? It can represent anger, it can represent passion, destruction, determination, all these different things. Um, it's a symbol of powerful or, or power of control. And then if we look at the, the image of dead children, that's a really, really shocking image to be putting there, a raging fire of dead children. And we can see this as an allusion, as a reference to perhaps the Soweto uprising. And we can understand this, this um, because of this image, we can understand this stanza or what the children's role is in this poem. It's just that the children are the ones who are sort of leading the resistance movement. Um, if you think of the Soweto uprising, that was high school students that were campaigning and fighting. And lots of historians will tell you that the Soweto uprising was the beginning of the end of apartheid. And so the dead children, the imagery of that shows how much these children have actually sacrificed and how much they are driving this period of uncertainty, which is going to lead to, you know, a new South Africa, ultimately. Um, and so they seem to, the children seem to be the ones who are, you know, fighting the apartheid government, um, you know, burning the fires, burning the fires, making the fires and fighting against this oppression. And the sky collapsing under centuries of rain. Think about the sky. The sky is a symbol of power or control. So in this case, in this 
example on this line, it could perhaps indicate that they are part of the government as the symbol of power, because now the symbol of power is collapsing. Collapsing is also a really dangerous and violent process if something collapses. And to abolish the oppression, and this links to what we said earlier about perhaps, you know, we have the season of winter, the season of uncertainty and violence, because in order to enact positive change, maybe we need some sort of big thing to happen beforehand, a period where there might be violence and uncertainty and oppression. Um, and so here, this idea of collapsing, it's a negative connotations, but ultimately the sky collapsing in this case is a positive thing because it's the sense of the apartheid government falling. And the centuries of rain, centuries of rain, um, you think about rain as sort of the oppressive politics that the sky has sort of been wielding and upon upon South Africans, right? So you think of like the skies, the apartheid government and the rain coming down as all these oppressive policies and all of this violence and centuries. And I think it's interesting because at first glance, I was like, mm, maybe this could be hyperbole because, you know, apartheid hasn't gone on for centuries. But actually, we can see this not as hyperbole, but just as racist oppression in general, because even though apartheid only started in 1948, the custom of racist policies extends way back you know into colonial period and even pre-colonial period in south africa so the use of centuries emphasizes the magnitude and longevity of the oppression and the endurance and the resilience of the resistors the wind like a mountain crying a really interesting line over here because we have sort of two natural images being compared to each other with the simile um we also have a mountain crying which is personification because a mountain can't actually cry that's sort of a human emotion or human um, action um, and I think the crying could be a, a play on the word raining and in this case this rain is is painful because what the rain represents is something incredibly painful so it's not just raining but the mountains crying so the wind like a mountain crying if you think about the connotation of a mountain it's strong and immovable and so if a mountain is crying, it emphasizes how no one is immune to the pain and struggle that is imminently approaching. That this winter coming is even going to affect the mountain, sort of the strongest, you know, this fortitude. It's everyone's going to be impacted. And if you also think about the wind, the wind travels and it's almost like this wind, this crying or this desperation or this winter of uncertainty is traveling all over and it transports the mountains crying all over South Africa. Who is not frightened of this winter coming upon us now? And so here we have a slight change to the refrain, but we still have the, the real refrain there, but we just have a slight um, change, the extension of the refrain actually, um, which he asks again, who is not frightened? And using the word coming, this present participle, once again, it's approaching and now emphasizes the imminent arrival of struggle. Now the question posed is absolutely rhetorical. No one could possibly not be scared. So at the beginning, when she's going through this refrain, she's sort of like questioning, making us think now at the end of this, after going through all these different stanzas, we are like 100% convinced that this, you know, that everyone is scared, that being frightened, that being not frightened is a real like 1% exception of people. Everyone is feeling worried at the sense of uncertainty that's that's coming upon South Africa. So in this last stanza, we can think of the literal, the poverty and the bad conditions are so cold and this, this sort of coldness of winter makes the children want to light a fire even though it's dangerous. But we can also understand in the figurative that sort of adults maybe cower away from resistance or not cower away, but maybe are not so. We know that we know that the youth are more radical than, than the, the you know older people. And so maybe adults are, you know, more immovable, but the children rise up against the winter. They rise up against the uncertainty, against the oppression of apartheid, and they want to fight for their futures. And they're going to fight by using fires, by, you know, using their determination, their passion, their anger for what's going on to fight against this winter, to fight against the oppression of apartheid. So in terms of our structure, we have lots of enjambment, as we've discussed. We have no rhyme scheme in this poem. It's a free verse poem. And I think that really emphasizes how unpredictable um, and uncertain this period is. And that's what the whole poem is about, this season or this period in South Africa, South African history being incredibly, incredibly unpredictable. And so the lack of a rhyme scheme, as readers, we're like, where's the rhyme scheme? We don't know sort of what's coming. And that imitates 
how South Africans felt during the 1980s. The repeated refrain with the question mark keeps on reminding us to be frightened. The tone of this poem could be described as fearful, foreboding, distressing, pensive, solemn and ominous. And the mood could be foreboding, uncertainty, anticipation. The theme and the message, oppression, apartheid, violence, resistance, imminent danger, defiance and fear, inescapable danger during a necessary period of change. And it sort of acts as this warning to us um, about this unpredictable winter season that is coming, whether that's literal or figurative. I really hope you found that helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like this video and to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to another Try Tutors video. In today's video, we're going to be unpacking the poem Talk to the Peach Tree by Sipo Sapamla. So firstly, a little bit of information about our poet so that we can understand the context of the poem better. He was born in 1932 and he passed away in 2007. He was a South African poet, an anti-apartheid writer who wrote a lot of protest poetry. If we can understand the years in which he lived and his identity as a South African writer, um, he lived during apartheid, during its height, but also during its ending. And so we're going to see in this poem particularly, he is talking about the demise of apartheid and all that goes along with that. So let's have a look at the title and discuss a bit of background to this poem. So in terms of the background, we have to understand apartheid started in 1948 and it continued all the way until 1994. But the last four years of apartheid were a period of transition from 1990 to 1994. There was this period where there was this alternating of violence and negotiations taking place between the National Party and the ANC, as well as many other political, soon to be political parties. Um, everyone was discussing and negotiating in terms of what the new South Africa would look like. So in 1990, Nelson Mandela, as well as a number of other political prisoners were released, the ANC and the PAC were unbanned, and this sort of signified the start of this negotiating period. However, that negotiating period was not all smooth sailing. There was a lot of disagreements. There was an unwillingness to compromise on different sides of this of these negotiations. Um, and as I said, all these negotiations kept being sort of, um, you know, stopped or they were, um, no one was willing to compromise so that they, so the negotiations sort of stalled. But at the same time, you had this violence going on. Um, and all these negotiations were trying to figure out a new philosophy, a new constitution, a new direction for the new South Africa. So the reference to talk in the title is signifying that period of negotiations. Um, remember that, you know, this, these negotiations went on for four years um, and only with the democratic elections on the 27th of April 1994 was there some sort of understanding of what the new South Africa would be. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a specific date as to when this poem was written, so my interpretation has been that this is about this period of time, this period of negotiating. It could also be linked to a little bit earlier, maybe the 1980s, where there's this discussion about negotiations because, you know, it doesn't just happen 1990 that suddenly things take a turn. It's taking a turn from the 1980s where there's a lot of resistance to apartheid. So maybe it's linking towards the late 1980s, maybe it's more towards the early 90s, but it's all about the sense of talking about negotiating, about founding a new way forward for South Africa. Now, the symbol of the peach tree is quite interesting, and if you look at the title, um, you know, as a whole, it is quite an absurd title. It's slightly strange that you're talking, that he's instructing us to talk to a peach tree. But if you think about the symbolism of a peach tree, a peach tree has its own space, it has its own land, it has deep roots which take a long time to grow. It's also a peach tree, so it is bearing fruit, it is successful in that way, it is prosperous in that way. A peach tree cannot be moved, it's a part of the garden forever, it is something with roots, something that is sturdy. And 
as I said, it bears fruit and therefore it is successful. So peach trees think about that symbolism and when we get um, when we go later on into the poem, we're going to see the reference to the peach tree again and we're going to understand what the symbolism is for. Um, but also keep in mind what a peach tree needs. It needs many things just to, to sustain its life. It needs water, it needs oxygen, um, it needs sunlight, um, all these different things, or well, maybe not oxygen, maybe it needs carbon dioxide photosynthesis, but um, you know, all of these different aspects in order for the, for the peach tree to prosper. And we can also think of the peach tree as symbolic of family and family roots, but we'll get closer or deeper into the meaning of the peach tree later on in this poem. Let's talk to the swallows visiting us in summer, ask how it is in other countries. Let's talk to the afternoon shadow, ask how the day has been so far. Let's raise our pets to our level, ask them what they don't know of us. So we start off this poem with a casual invitation. Let's talk. Let us show the sense of unity and togetherness. Let's talk to the swallows. Now this is a very strange idea that we can talk to animals. And what it really emphasizes is this idea of asking of all different perspectives in terms of, you know, coming to the to the start of negotiations. We need to have an understanding of all different aspects of South African people. We have to ask all different perspectives in order to build a new South Africa. Also, you should think that swallows migrate, so they come from, you know, one country to another country. And that's why we need to ask these swallows, because they have been to these other countries, and we need to ask them, how do other countries function? How do they have, you know, peace and prosperity for all of their citizens? How do they, um, you know, prioritize equality? Perhaps it's also signifying specifically African countries, because African countries during the 1960s and 1970s were gaining independence and completely rebuilding their government structures. So maybe we need, um, you know, information from them, or we need some sort of inspiration from those countries. So the idea of building a whole nation or a whole new system of governance, you can understand the magnitude of that request and that's why we need to ask all these different perspectives. Let's talk to the afternoon shadow. If you think about the afternoon shadow, the afternoon shadow observes the day. We need to ask people or beings or concepts that have been around for a while or have been noticing different things. We want wisdom in terms of how we create this new South Africa. Ask how the day has been so far understand as well the day of the shadow so if you think about all of these um you know the swallows the afternoon shadow as being indicative of a type of person um, that we need to be asking about how they should be integrated or their perspective on the new south africa we need to understand their day we need to understand what they've been through we need to understand their struggles so he uses this form of personification by giving these animals the ability to have a meaningful conversation or these concepts. Let's raise our pets to our level. So swallows, afternoon shadow and pets, not usually things we would ask advice of. The speaker is saying the negotiation should be inclusive of all the people previously denied a voice. The groups that the apartheid government put on the level of pets. Ask them what they don't know of us. Notice the repetition of let's and ask. It's really engaging with the reader and emphasizes this message of engaging with everyone. The comment is being made on how the white people don't know anything about African people because they've always thought of themselves as superior. They've always thought of themselves as different a level above. And now comes the time of negotiations and building a new South Africa. And the speaker is commenting on the fact that it is important for every single part of South Africa to be recognized and for white people to understand the struggles and the lifestyles and everything that's going on within the African setting. The use of our in this stanza um, and just the meaning of these stanzas sort of suggests then that this is from the perspective of the apartheid government that they are sort of talking amongst themselves and they're saying we have now got to talk to people who we've previously dismissed or people who we've previously oppressed um, so the use of pronouns is quite interesting here because it seems to be from the perspective of the apartheid regime or white people in general 
Words have lost meaning. Like all notations, they've been misused. Most people will admit a whining woman can overstate her case. So these two stanzas are actually indented because this is a form of commentary. It's, an, it's a form of an aside. This is the speaker's sort of commentary, his comments on the situation. So it's slightly removed from the rest of the poem. And so therefore we can understand that you can see the difference in tone, that the tone, there's a tone of encouragement at first, but this tone is a lot more reflective and slightly despairing because he comments on some, you know, not, you know, some less than ideal aspects of the negotiation process. He says words have lost meaning and this is about that difference between words versus action. Freedom has been promised, but not yet secured. The negotiations dragged on for years and get caught up on things that the different sides couldn't or wouldn't compromise on. Like all notations, notations are ways of writing. They've been misused. Things were promised, but they were never actually fulfilled. So you can see the sense of um, despair or distrust of the negotiation process. Most people will admit um, if you think about the connotations of admit, it's telling the truth, but maybe not really wanting to if you have to admit that you've done something wrong. A whining woman can overstate her case. A whining woman, notice the alliteration, it emphasizes a sense of distress and moaning. Whining is what you do when you're complaining incessantly in an annoying way, maybe not about something serious. So a whining woman can sort of signify this unwillingness to compromise can overstate her case, meaning can over-exaggerate sort of her perspective or what um, she wants to happen and therefore is unwilling to compromise on that. So making a big, bigger deal out of something than it truly is. Um, and maybe this is a comment on the war of words. These negotiations are perhaps, you know, leading towards failure. There was a lot of that sense during the 1990s, the early 1990s, there was, you know, no one knew that the negotiations were ultimately going to be successful. Um, it was a very sort of tricky and unsettling time. Um, and this line also hints at the fact that suffering people are becoming frustrated with the way of negotiations and how they're continuing. There is this suggestion that perhaps the negotiations have become misconstrued or have strayed from their intended purpose to end the violence and oppression because what's happening in the early 90s is there is a lot of violence as well as the negotiations taking place so there's a sense of sense of cynicism about the whole negotiation process talk to the paralyzing heat in the air Inquire how long the mercilessness will last. Let's pick out items from the rubbish heap. Ask how the stench is like down there. Let's talk to the peach tree. Find out how it feels to be in the ground. Talk to the paralyzing heat in the air. So now we're back to talking. We are done with that aside or the commentary. We're back to the, to the poem itself. Talk to the paralyzing heat. Paralyzing is oppressing and completely sort of claustrophobic this heat and what does the heat in the air signify it signifies apartheid and it's saying that apartheid needs to end the negotiations must actually reach their conclusion they've been going on too long inquire how long the mercilessness will last mercilessness meaning apartheid but also could signify the anticipation of the negotiation actually concluding. It's been going on for so long. It's this mercilessness suffering. Long really emphasizes the suffering of South African people. And if you think of mercilessness as well, it definitely can signify apartheid in the sense that to be merciless is to have no compassion and care. And that's exactly what you can define the apartheid system as this system of lack of compassion, lack of care. And so it's really driving home the urgency of the need for these negotiations to actually conclude and come to fruition because this mercilessness has been going on for so long. This claustrophobic heat has trapped South Africa of its true potential and its true nature. Let's pick out items from the rubbish heap. Now we're back to asking for people's advice. The let's signifies that. 
And this is a really sort of troubling image, but the apartheid government treated African people like rubbish. The speaker says that the negotiation should talk to them to find out what their lives have been like, but also to show them to hurry and to end apartheid, sort of signifying how the apartheid government needs to address all these different people that they have wronged and that they've oppressed and understand what they've been through in order to, you know, for the negotiations to build a better South Africa. But at the same time, talking to these people is going to alert um, those in charge of any of the political parties, but alert them to how serious this matter is and how the negotiations need to be hurried in order for us to achieve a better South Africa as quickly as possible. Ask how the stench is down there. Stench. Think of the connotations of stench. It's a strong and terrible smell, alluding to the terrible conditions. Down there, if you think of the word down, alludes to the level that we spoke about back in stanza three. Let's talk to the peach tree. So here we are referring to the title. Find out how it feels to be in the ground. To be in the ground is really significant because it means it has a claim and a place to call home. Black people do not have their own land at this time and there's the sense of the lack of stability because remember the apartheid government was all about disowning African people of their land and of their right to being South African, hence the passport system, hence the homelands and so African people have been displaced for so long and so the symbol of talking to the actual of the peach tree and of finding out how it actually feels to be um, stable to they're asking the tree sort of what it's like to have been you know allowed and have been permitted to have the land it deserves and to be able to be fruitful and to grow and then we can also think about the peach tree as symbolic of family and family roots asking ancestors asking family about how it feels to have a country that is going to support you um you know talking to those sorts of people getting that influence in the creation of the new south africa let's talk to the moon going down ask if it isn't enough eyeing what's been going on so in this second to last stanza the speaker says let's talk to the moon going down and this imagery is representative of the window of opportunity for democracy and peace is dwindling the moon is going down you know we need to come to some sort of understanding of what the new staffer will be very soon ask if it isn't enough eyeing what's been going on ask he keeps encouraging the reader to think to ask he is involving the reader within this poem the moon is personified. It's given power as to viewing these events that are going on in South Africa. And the speaker asks, is anyone else seeing what's going on? Um, has the chance for, you know, we have this chance for peace, but we seem to be failing or it's seemingly taking too long to end this mercilessness. Come on, let's talk to the devil himself. It's about time. And once again, come on, really encouraging the reader to come along with the speaker as they fight for South Africa's freedom. Let's talk to the devil himself. Do you see how the let's, the pronoun of let's, could be changing throughout the poem? But here, the devil himself is clearly the apartheid regime and its leaders. And so there's this ultimate understanding that who we actually really need to talk to in order for these negotiations to go smoothly, but also in order for, um, in order for South Africa to to be the best, the best version of South Africa, there's the sense of confrontation that, it's, that is needed towards the apartheid regime. It's about time. It's about time we confront them and demand justice. It's about time that they are held responsible for what they've done. And it's about time that their power is finally ended. There's a sense in this poem that there's so many different perspectives and we need to use all these perspectives to create one vision for South Africa but that that is something challenging. It's not something easy to integrate all those different perspectives. And we have this understanding at the end of the poem that, you know, that it hasn't really come to fruition yet. Um, as I said, unfortunately, I don't know exactly what year this poem was written, but we have this understanding with the lack of the full stop, even at the end of the poem, that this process is still continuing. This 
dream, this vision of South Africa is still in the process of being created or being established. So the structure of this poem, the indentation of those two standards, stanzas, indicate a commentary. There's no punctuation in the poem, and that indicates this lack of a resolution. Enjambment, this enjambment throughout the poem, indicates or emphasizes the continuation of the plight of those suffering under apartheid oppression. The free verse nature of the rhyme scheme um, emphasizes the sense of sincerity and also the fact that it's sort of going against sort of typical rhyme scheme. It shows this trying or this attempt to break free of apartheid oppression. The tone of the poem is cynical, conversational, encouraging at times and sincere. There's a mood of frustration, but at some points encouragement. So you need to really assess in terms of which lines you're being asked to analyze what the tone and the mood are. The theme and the message. The theme and the message is created through all the absurd imagery that happens, which creates a sense of humor, which really actually reinforces the seriousness of the theme and message. The urgency to end apartheid, the pursuit of freedom, recognizing different perspectives, negotiations and words, and the question of are they meaningful or are they useless? I hope that you found this video helpful in your study of this poem. Please remember to like the video and to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to another Try to Test video. In today's video we're going to be unpacking the poem Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas. So firstly, as always, we start by assessing our poet so that we can better understand the context and the framework before diving into this poem. Dylan Thomas lived between 1914 and 1953. He was a famous Welsh poet and writer, and he's known for his word usage and vivid imagery. His genre of writing is really quite interesting because he's known as a modernist poet, yet he has influences of other movements as well, such as in this poem, we can see some elements of the 19th century romantic movement and how he talks about nature in this poem so he's influenced by all these different genres so it's difficult to define exactly in which particular genre his poetry can be placed um let's get into discussing the title now so fern hill is actually a place or the play the name of a farm which dylan thomas's relative owned and where he spent a lot of time in his childhood so it's a place in Wales where he grew up, but the title Fern Hill can also just signify the setting. And this setting is going to prompt the reflection that takes place throughout the poem. It's almost like a diary entry. You put sort of where you are and then you're talking about the reflections that happen while you're there. So as the speaker thinks about Fern Hill and thinks back to Fern Hill, then these are all the thoughts that come into his head, which is going to be the rest of the poem. So the title is incredibly personal because it's about his personal childhood. But I think that you'll agree with me at the end of this poem that the themes and the ideas are really quite universal. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, above the lilting house and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, time let me hail and climb, golden in the heydays of his eyes, and honoured among wagons I was prince of the apple towns, and once below a time I lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall white. So if we have a look at our first stanza, our first line, we start with now, which already indicates to us that this is going to be a reflective and sincere poem. The I shows us this first person perspective. This is a personal poem. I was young and easy. This means that life was easy. It was carefree. It was relaxed. So this speaker is reflecting on his childhood, on when he was running around the farm Fern Hill and what he was experiencing. So he is an adult now and he's looking back and reflecting on the past. And he says that when you're young, life is young and easy. It's easy. It's carefree. It's relaxed. 
under the apple for um, boughs. Boughs means branches. Um, so in nature, about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green. You can notice the conversational tone already, the now, the I, the enjambment. The enjambment here, enjambment is run on line, so you see bows doesn't end on a full stop, it continues on to the next line. Um, and this is really indicative of the sincerity of reflection, of authenticity. It's almost these unfiltered thoughts that he is having. The lilting house, lilting is sort of melodic and buoyant. It has this connotation of like buoyancy. And the alliteration house and happy is adds to the sense of breathlessness. And so it's almost like these really happy days. And you can see from the lilting and the alliteration, breathless happiness. As the grass was green, this is a simile. And this really is comparing it's a sense of certainty so it's comparing his happiness to the certainty of the grass being green and so he's saying that during his childhood he experienced the certainty of joy it was so vivid in his life it was as natural as the grass being green the natural imagery here is going to continue later on and whenever we have natural imagery i like to think or the way it's hoping it comes across to me in poetry is it's this idea of all is right in the world idea because nature is something righteous or something where it should be especially when it's being described so beautifully like this if you think about green green is also a symbol for optimism youth for harmony but also for inexperience and naivety and we're going to see this color being repeated all the time throughout this poem to emphasize how during this period of the speaker's life when he was a child he was incredibly green in a sense he was optimistic he was youthful he was in harmony with nature but he was also inexperienced and naive about the world the night above the dingle starry so the night above he's talking about when night falls in the dingle dingle is a forested valley starry filled with stars time let me hail and climb now we're going to get to a really key theme in this poem which is time time is being personified here and if we think about time in terms of when we're a child versus when we're an adult in childhood time is extremely forgiving um, we think that we have a lot of time when we're young even if you think of little kids they don't really have an understanding of time moving forward or time having sort of this finite nature to it in the sense that you can tell a kid oh there's five minutes left and they have no idea what really five minutes means to them they've just got the whole day ahead of them and their whole lives ahead of them time he addresses time or he he uses time as a sense of personification because he allows he gives time the power to let him do things so it's giving him or it's giving time a human quality um and therefore he's giving time power and so in his childhood time let me hail and climb hail meaning like praise and climb if you think about climb it's a physical activity akin to or similar to or hinting at a child's energy right they're always climbing things but also, if you think figuratively what climb could signify, it could mean always desiring more. And when we're a kid, we have these big dreams. We're always desiring more and more things. We're climbing. Golden in the heydays of his eyes. Golden. Gold is another color that's going to be repeated throughout this poem. Gold is enriching. It's beautiful. And so he's talking about his days as a child being enriching and beautiful days. In the heydays, if we think about the meaning of heydays, it is a period of a person's greatest success or activity. So in your heyday, meaning when you were most successful, when you were most active. And I think it's interesting, he's talking about golden in the heyday. So he's talking about his childhood as being sort of his heyday, but he's only recognizing it as his heyday in reflection, in retrospect of his eyes eyes are the window to the soul you can see someone's excitement and joy through their eyes this his could refer to time itself that time um you know has sort of looked down on him and has given him all of this in his childhood but you can also think of it like golden the heyday of his eyes it's almost like someone separate from him he's this completely different person 
when he was a child to who he is now. And honoured among wagons, I was prince of the apple pound. Honoured, um, here we're going to have some, some fairy tale imagery of wagons and princesses. If you think about wagons, they sing, signify sort of commoners in fairy tales. And then the prince, obviously, he says, I was prince. This is a metaphor. This is a comparison. He's not really a prince. But um, he is comparing himself to a prince of the Apple Town. So this is a fictional place, obviously. Um, and obviously, like a child, what he sees around him, that's what he's going to name his town. So he sees all the apple branches from the first stanza. And so he names it Apple Town. So lots of apples. He's in an orchard. And he's the prince of this town, in inverted commas. And once below a time, I lordly had the trees and leaves. And now he talks about being this prince of who his subjects are they are the trees and the leaves and he lordly goes about his business and you know controlling them and i think the image of a prince is so significant because um you know firstly when you just think of children children use their imagination a lot so they would play pretend and they would create characters and be this is you know the king this is the queen this is the prince but also if you think about a prince a prince is someone who we think of is being in control of something, having power, having purpose, having a place in the world. And when we're a child, we often have that sense of comfort. We feel like a sort of prince. We feel like we're in control and we have power. And later on, as we mature, we realize how naive we were because, um, you know, as an adult, we realize we're actually not immune to a whole bunch of different things about life, a bunch of different realities that we don't recognize when we're a child, when we're naive and we think we can control things. Notice the enjambment here again and this lack of punctuation. It's almost all these images merging together. You sort of see one thing and think of another and it's almost reflective lens of, um, you know, of how children think, how they this and that and the next thing. And it's almost also like he's thinking about these ideas and as he thinks of one idea, another one comes crashing back to him. So his thoughts and ideas are flowing as we can see through this enjambment and this lack of punctuation trail with daisies and barley so trail meaning like hanging down there's this abundance of plants that's hanging on these trees and these leaves and there's daisies and barley there's this beautiful abundance of nature um it's almost like he has this kingdom and it's filled with nature as his subjects down the rivers of the windfall light so down the rivers think of the connotation of a river of water it's of a life of fullness windfall or light really has positive connotations windfall is like when a fruit is blown off a tree in the wind so it's almost like this natural occurrence once again and so we really get this understanding of this abundance the, the sense of the abundant spirit in his childhood and you know just this entire stanza just points to this sense of natural imagery of beauty in the world and how a child would see the world In this poem, we can see how nature mirrors or reflects his joy. His emotion is caught up in the imagery of nature. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the bards, about the happy yard and singing as the farm was home, in the sun that is young only once, time let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means, and green and golden, I was huntsman and herdsman, the calves sang to my horn, the foxes on the hills barked clear and cold, and the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. We notice a lot of repetition in this poem, which really adds to this conversational tone. It's almost like he's speaking freely, and when we speak freely, we tend to repeat. And it's also used to emphasize the um, themes and the message that he's trying to relay with these repeated words. And as I was green and carefree, green once again, young, innocent, naive, inexperienced, famous among the barns, he's well known or loved in his home, he's sort of in his element, he is the prince, he is famous in his, in his little kingdom that he's created. About the happy yard, this is an example of a transferred epithet where the adjective being used here, happy, to describe a yard, is not really describing the yard, but it's actually describing the speaker being happy and how the yard is therefore this happy place 
and singing as the farm was home. Farm, the farm to him, Fernhill, is the sanctuary. He felt safe and comfortable. This was his home. In the sun that is young, oh, once only. So we are only young once. We may not realize it at the time, but we are only young once. Time, let me play and be golden in the mercy of his meanings. So time to a child stretches on forever. Once again, time being personified here, being given power. The enjambment in these two lines shows time continuing on golden. Golden is almost a really majestic colour. It's the majesty of childhood. And golden as well can refer to he's reveling in the sun's golden rays, which represents all the time he has to play. Because when you're a kid, it's all about whether the sun is up or whether, you know, the moon is up. When it, you know, when the sun is out, then you're free to play and have a great time. And that's what he's talking about here. He's reveling in the sun's rays. In the mercy of his means, that alliteration of the M sound is really long. It sort of draws it out. That's the effect. Or that's, that's what time is to a child. It really can be drawn out. And green and golden, once again, those repeated colours, green and experience, gold and preciousness. I was huntsman and herdsman. So going back to the first stanza where he was a prince, now he plays all these different roles like children do by playing pretend. But notice how these roles, a huntsman and a herdman, are natural and earthly endeavours. So it shows how much the Fernhill environment has affected and influenced his upbringing, which we can consider as a key theme in this poem. The calves sang to my horn, the foxes on the hills barked clear and cold. So the calves singing, that's the show shepherd and herdsman. The foxes on the hills bark, that's the hunting side. And clear and cold, that alliteration is effective because it's a really harsh alliteration, so it emphasises the sort of harshness of hunting and foxes. Um, and the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. So now we're going to get this um, reference to, to the Bible, and even earlier as well, if we to speak about, you know, huntsmen and herdsmen, there's a connection to nature and, and you know, even... Bible stories about shepherds and hunters and then we have the mention of the Sabbath obviously and the Sabbath is this holy day of rest um, and so this can refer to this idea of childhood being a really holy time but it could also refer to you know now it's time to rest it's the end of the day it's the end of the day of play notice the rang so we have this image of a church bell ringing and it's auditory so it's you know, all these different senses, whenever a speaker or a poem uses different senses, it really just makes the poem all the more meaningful and understandable to the reader. So it's the church bells ring that make him recognize the approach of the Sabbath in the pebbles of the holy stream. I think this, the, the preposition in is significant here because it's nature is sort of embedded within or holiness is embedded within nature. So it's in the pebbles this holiness is in the pebbles of the holy stream and nature is holy and worth revering in the last line of the first stanza we spoke about a river now we have another water image of the stream but i also want to consider how religion you know this reverence to religion sort of makes you think of the role of religion and religion is in a sense a way to guide people and show people the way it's something that is to to you know, that people honor and i think we can refer to because of all the natural imagery here we can see how to the speaker nature was his guidance nature was his form of faith or religion that guided him and showed him sort of the pathway through his childhood All the sun long it was running, it was lovely, the hay fields high as the house, the tunes from the chimney, it was air and plain, lovely and watery, and fire green as grass, and nightly under the simple stars, as I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away, all the moon long I heard, blessed among stables, the night jars flying with the ricks, and the horses flashing into the dark. So all the sun long it was running it's you know as a child the whole day to him is wide open for play and it's all about 
being, you know, in the middle of the farm. You don't have a watch. You don't have a clock. Um, it's something, you know, that you, you watch the sun and then you know whether it's daytime or nighttime. The sun determines the day just as it determined the day of early humans. It was lovely, his being reflective here, thinking back. The hay fields high as the house. This is alliteration and it's a simile. The enjambment shows the continuation, the continued flow of memory. The fields high as the house. Um, it could also, you can think of those bit as hyperbole as well. Maybe a little bit of an over-exaggeration. The tunes from the chimneys. There's lots of references to song. Which is interesting because something that you think about maybe when you think of nature, or at least I think of nature as being sort of quiet and silent as opposed to, you know, the city where it's always busy and loud and industrial sounds. But actually nature is filled with song and joyous rhythms of the birds and just in general nature is actually very song-like. It was air and playing lovely and watery. So it's Oh, just to go back to chimneys, actually. So the, the reference to house and chimney shows us not just all nature, but this farmhouse, too, has a positive meaning to it, has a positive connotation to the speaker. So the air, he was playing lovely watery, just all these beautiful um, words and beautiful diction to describe and to reflect and reiterate and reinforce how wonderful this period of his life was and how the daytime was. And fire green as grass. And this simile once again emphasizing how he's playing and enjoying life in all weather and all circumstances. Um, everything always looked green to him as a child. It always looked optimistic to him. And nightly under the simple stars. Simple stars, that alliteration, that imagery. As I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away. So now talking about the end of the day coming. The moon is now out. They're the simple stars. Um, the sun has, you know, left. It's no longer daytime. There's no time for play now. But even as he's sleeping, the images of the farm come to him. As I rode, I like this diction of road because even going to sleep as a child is like an adventure. I rode to sleep. The owls, the owls remember his subjects who undertake his bidding, him as the prince or as this famous person, as he says earlier were bearing the farm away. It's almost like the farm moves with him into his dreams. So as a child, I think we can all think back and, you know, even when we notice children today, they seem to think that the world revolves around them. So it's almost like the farm exists only for him. And so as he sleeps, the farm is taken into his dreams by the owls for him. Everything is just being done for him. That's his entire world. All the moon long I heard, so think back to the first line of the stanza, the sun determines the day, the moon determines the night, so as long as the moon is up, as long as he's sleeping, as long as it's night time, blessed among the stables, the night jars, he hears, a night jar is a nocturnal bird with a distinctive call, flying with the ricks, ricks is a stack of hay, and the horses flash into the dark, and then it becomes dark. So as this could mean that as sleep overtakes him, or we can refer to um, now we're moving to the next stanza where he is going to reflect on this idea sort of flashing in the dark of his childhood because now he's going to awaken and realize his childhood innocence has gone. And then to awake and the farm like a wanderer white with the dew come back the cock on his shoulder. It was all shining. It was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again, and the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light in the first spinning pace, the spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable onto the fields of praise. So, and then to awake, this awakening is figurative. He's no longer a child. A child, he's now an adult. Um, and the farm, like a wanderer whale, with the dew come back. So the, he is saying that the farm has sort of come back to him. This this image of the farm is really powerful. It's his whole childhood is wrapped up in this image, in this place. Like a wanderer white, this is alliteration. It's this W sound. It really emphasizes a sense of wondrous and wondrous intrigue. It's almost like he's awakening from a reality and now exploring the new reality. 
with the dew, dew is the moisture that you find on the ground early in the morning, so this signifies a new chapter, because now he's talking about, about awakening um, to this new day. So it's almost like he's awakening, he's sort of now an adult and looking back, so again he's sort of awakening this idea of his past, but it can also be like a child every single day is such a brand new, amazing, exciting opportunity. Um, and so he is seeing like with the Jew, this is a new chapter, a new day, a new sense of excitement. Um, the rooster crows, it was all shining. The whole farm and this childhood is shining. Think of the connotations of shining. It's glittering, it's marvelous. Yet if something's shiny, it's probably unattainable and unrealistic in adulthood. In adulthood, you perhaps know too much for something to be incredibly shiny. It was Adam and Maiden. This is a metaphor, obviously, the, literally, um, the farm is not Adam and Eve, but it's a metaphor and it's an allusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, meaning a reference to the Garden of Eden. He is comparing the farm to the Garden of Eden, which shows how idyllic and wondrous this farm and his childhood was. The sky gathered again, it's a new day, there's a sense of reset, the sun comes up, and the sun grew round that very day, round meaning full, that very day, it's this important day, and we're going to see what this important day is, it's this first day of life, it's the creation of the earth, so it must have been after the birth of the simple light, notice simple being repeated from earlier, you know, the sense of when you're in childhood, life is simple, so after the birth of simple light, it's after daybreak, he's reflecting here about the first day of sort of life and it's it's like when you're a child you just have all these new opportunities, new ideas, new excitement for every single day. In the first spinning place, um, in the first place, meaning the Garden of Eden, spinning place, if we think of the globe, if we think of earth, the spellbound horses walking warm. Spellbound, it's like fairy tale connotations. Walking warm, that alliteration mimics the movement. Out of the whinnying green stable. Green stable, green, once again saying the sense of newness. We see another transferred epithet here um, because the horses are actually making this whinnying sound, which is also onomatopoeia, not actually the stable. Onto the fields of praise. Praising, there's a sense of praising the creator. And it links back to the previous stanza, this idea that nature must almost be worshipped, adored, and revered. And honoured among foxes and pheasants by the gay house, under the new-made clouds, and happy as the heart was long, in the sun borne over and over, I ran my heedless ways, my wishes raced through the house high hay, and nothing I cared, at my sky blue trade that time allows in all his tuneful turning so few and such morning songs before the children green and golden follow him out of grace and so an honored among foxes and pheas pheasants pheasants are birds um by the gay house gay meaning happy another transferred epithet the house is not happy but it's made happy by his experience of him being happy so um, the transferred epithet really just emphasizes this joyous recollection that it's so joyous that his, his like, you know, what he thinks of when he thinks of this house, that it, the joy has transferred to the house, it's transferred to the things itself. So it really just emphasizes the joy and the happiness and the satisfaction he felt as a child. Under the new made clouds, so it's almost like the new made clouds, like the world has been created just for him. Happy as the heart was long, here we have a sim simile, and it's just emphasizing how life is really long when you're a child. It's our perspective as a child. We see life as being long and endless. In the sun born over and over, it's the sense it's a new day every day. There are endless days, endless opportunities. I ran my heedless ways. Heedless meaning reckless or careless. There was no sort of worry or concern or responsibility when he was a child. He just had day after day to, to run carefree. My wishes raced through the house high hay. It's almost like an image of paradise that he keeps talking about when he's a child. I mean, he's literally actually used the illusion of the Garden of Eden, which is the very definition of paradise. So all his wishes are fulfilled. Um, if you think of the word race, like children are always racing, they're always striving, they're always running somewhere. 
house high hey this is alliteration but it's also hyperbolic um and it's also you know this idea of wishes could also refer to like how adults maybe don't act on their wishes they're more conservative whereas children act on their wishes if they desire something they sort of go about racing to make it happen and nothing i cared so he was carefree he cared about nothing the sentence structure is interesting here he doesn't say i cared about nothing he says and nothing i cared because it emphasizes the nothing so it emphasizes how he truly didn't care about anything he didn't have any concerns or worries when he was a child he has a sense of freedom um, from re worry from responsibility which is you know that responsibility that worry associated with adulthood he is free from that at my sky blue trade so sky blue trade a trade is like an activity um, and sky blue sort of referring to this to the sun or well, the sun being out in the beautiful sky it's like the activity that he did during the day because you know we'd already dis discussed the sort of difference between the day and the night to a child that time allows and all his tuneful toning so few and such morning songs so that time allows once again is this idea of time permitting him to have this childhood to have these memories in his tuneful turning, that alliteration of the T sound sort of imitates a ticking sound of a clock. So few. So now in hindsight, as he reflects, you know, in his childhood, it seemed like it was endless. But actually, time is sort of finite as an adult. We realize that our time is going to end. We have few of these memories. We have few of these magical times. And such morning songs, once again, tuneful songs, all of this reference to, to sound. Before the children, green and golden, before the children who we know are green and golden, meaning innocent and inexperienced and sheltered, follow him out of grace, meaning that they mature. They fall out with this version of time. They're no longer carefree, innocent, or recognize the scarcity of time. Or they're no longer carefree and innocent, and now they start to recognize the scarcity of time. And they realize the abandonment of their childhood indulgences and they have to sort of be mature and could grow out of that. Nothing I cared in the lamb white days that time would take me up the, to the swallows thronged loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising nor that riding to sleep. I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. So notice throughout this poem, it keeps switching between the present tense and the past tense, showing the reflection on these sort of past memories and ideas. So this line, nothing I cared, is repeated for emphasis, and it also just emphasizes the sense of nostalgia and a longing for the past. In the lamb white days, lamb and white, both symbols, symbolic of purity and innocence. What time would take me? So um, when once again, time being personified, having this power, it's almost like we are, we live our life based on time schedule and time's will, whims. We are sort of, we don't really have a choice. Time tells us, okay, you're a child, you have time, or you're an adult, you sort of don't have time. And here time takes him up to the swallow thronged loft so to like the top of the tree that's densely packed with these swallows with these birds by the shadow of my hand the idea of shadow um can be symbolic here of like or representative of shadow is um something that is attached to you but it's not really you so his reality um as a child is now a shadow to him because it once was a part of him but it's no longer anymore it's it's reflection it's detached it's not his his adult self notice the enjambment here it's a sense of a journey of time is taking up taking him up to this magical place above the trees where he can interact with nature in the moon that is always rising um so the appearance of the moon shows that now he must sleep and inevitably awaken to find himself an adult the use of always really just signifies how time always continues. It always keeps moving. The moon is always rising. Time is ending. So as the moon rises, in this case, it's almost this idea of he is going to have to go to sleep now for, the, for, for sort of for this final time in his childhood and awaken to actually becoming a mature adult and leaving this behind. 
nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly in the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. So as he goes to sleep, time comes in and beforehand where it was, the owls carried the farm with him while he slept. Now time is going to come and sort of pluck out this, this, this memory or this lifestyle from him. And so um, this version of the farm is taken away by time. His childhood and his innocence can never be regained. The farm forever fled, that alliteration, just emphasizing the sense of this image and this whole ideal has escaped, been separated from him. It's now a childless land. The farm is now just a farm, as it always was in a literal sense. It's devoid of childhood wonder, now that the narrator has grown up. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his knee. So, oh, is an exclamation or an interjection, really making this conversational, really making it sincere and authentic. As I was young, so young and easy, hint or, you know, think back to that first line. When I was young and relaxed in the mercy of his knee, that alliteration draws out once again, that drawing out of the M sound, how time was long when he was a child. Time held me green and dying. So time... Um, you know, we are all subjects of time, almost. So um, time rules us. And here we have this melancholic tone. Um, as he reflects on, ultimately, his childhood dying and his childhood innocence and inexperience washing away. Time held me. Held is really powerful, so he has this control over him. Green and dying. So green meaning this inexperience and this innocence, and it's dying. His childhood innocence is going away. He still perhaps feels naive and inexperienced, but now the environment has shifted. It's no longer perhaps a positive thing to be green or to be inexperienced, to be innocent anymore. He's had to change. Though I sang in my chains like the sea. So though indicates, you know, it's but it's melancholic. He still wants to recapture all this beautiful sort of memory of his childhood. So he's not happy to sort of see it go. I sang... The reference to singing once again, this poem is really quite song-like in its structure um, and the poem is the link to the to the childhoodness. And so if you think of like a song, how it takes you back to something, you know, when you hear a song, you think of an experience or you think of a time in your life. And so he he's singing, he's trying to sort of recapture that moment, trying to recapture his childhood. Singing also signifies hope. He hopes that these memories and this song that he's created is going to sustain him in terms of its legacy in his life. It's going to keep him going and keep him sort of faithful to his ideals and excited about life. In my chains like the sea. So chains obviously symbolic of restriction. Like the sea, that simile, if we think of the sea as being vast, endless, deep. It's almost like he's saying the chains of adulthood, of responsibility, of growing up, um, sort of keep you captured in this endless deep pit. And um, he sings, he tries to remember these um, ideas of his childhood, tries to recapture those memories in a way to, to keep going through the pain, through the chains. So in terms of a general analysis, the structure of this poem, six, six stanzas, nine lines each. Um, there is a sort of patterning of the syllables used in every line. And this adds to this song-like quality, this lyrical quality to this poem. So we can describe this poem as being lyrical. There's a sprinkling of rhyme throughout. It's not, you know, a typical rhyme scheme. But the sprinkling of rhyme is almost like a magical chant or spell. And it adds to this harmonious mood. Um, there's lots of enjambment, lots of indentation, which really emphasizes the sincerity of the poem and the authenticity behind it. As I said earlier, it's almost like this unfiltered reflection. The tone of the poem can be described as reflective, contemplative, impassioned, fervent, authentic, um, ardent. And in the last few lines, you can even say melancholic. The mood is of nostalgia and perhaps wonder. The theme and the message about time and the power of time. Childhood versus adulthood and all the connotations attached to that that we've discussed. Nature and its wonders. Innocence versus experience. Naivety versus responsibility. And 
you know, those themes and messages sort of giving you like sort of subtitles. And we've discussed all the different elements of those ideas as we've analysed the poem. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video helpful. Please make sure to like and subscribe, like the video and subscribe to the channel. And hopefully I'll be back soon with some questions on some of your poems to help you prepare for final exams. Hello and welcome to another Translators video. In today's video we're going to be analysing the poem It is a Beauteous Evening Calm and Free by William Wordsworth. So a little bit about our poet, William Wordsworth, so that we can understand the context of the poem. William Wordsworth was born in 1770 and he died in 1850. He was an English poet and he is one of the most famous poets who's ever lived and he is associated with the Romantic Poetry Movement. This movement began in the late 18th century and went into the early 19th century and it's all about, you know, focusing on nature's harmony, about human emotion that's reflecting nature, about how nature provides meaning and it really focuses on a sense of creativity and spontaneity and he was one of the founders of this movement. Um, what's important with regard to this poem is that he had a daughter named Caroline with a French woman. So when he was in France, um, he met this woman and he left France before their child was born. And due to war, he was unable to return to France and so for a number of years. And so he only met his daughter Caroline when she was nine years old. And why that's important for this poem is because um, some say that the, that the dear child, the dear girl that he refers to um, in the sestet of the poem is actually with regard to his daughter and that this poem is actually about a reflection on the time where he met Caroline and they're having the seaside stroll. The poem is actually untitled, but it takes its title from the, it takes its name from the first line of the poem. So it is a beauteous evening, calm and free. Um, we, over here you can see we have three very powerful adjectives, beauteous, calm, free. And these strong connotations give a sense of expectation for what this evening is going to bring. The word beauteous has really grand connotations and a synonym for beauteous would be beautiful. But instead of just saying beautiful, which is a really common word, the use of beauteous is there to highlight the rarity, significance, status and even holiness of this evening or this reflection or this bond with nature as we're going to see is the key theme of this poem. Um, calm, that really refers to the mood of this poem as being extremely calm and serene and free. Well, we can think of free in two ways. Number one, it could be that nature is this free and spontaneous spirit, but also we can see it as the speaker being free from worry. He's reveling in nature. He's not worrying about sort of materialistic or physical things. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free. The holy time is quiet as a nun, breathless with adoration. The broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility. The gentleness of heaven broods over the sea. Listen, the mighty being is awake and doth with his eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlasting, everlastingly. So we start off this poem with that line from the title. It's beautiful, you can come and free, giving us the setting. And we continue on, the holy time is quiet as a nun. So why is this a holy time? Why would evening be holy? Well, it could be a time for prayer, but also if you think about nature and you think about the coming of the evening, you think about the sunset, this is a, this is a place where we can distinctly see sort of God's presence in nature. Because this poem is all about how through nature, the speaker sees God and he finds meaning. And so if you think about the sunset, we're directly seeing God you know, playing with nature and his presence in nature. And therefore this could be, this could signify a holy time. Quiet as a nun, breathless with adoration. So quiet as a nun, this is a simile, but it also has religious imagery. Once again, hinting at that idea of religion or God or fearing of God being in conjunction, being in connection with nature. Breathless with adoration. So if you think of like a nun praying, she is in awe of God. 
and in this context it would be in awe of nature so as the speaker is walking there's this quiet sereneness as he is in awe yet so quiet almost that you can't even hear her breathing it's breathless with adoration um it's almost like the evening is holding its breath to admire god to admire nature the broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility so the broad sun i think you know the use of broad it's sort of take the sun it's taking up the whole sky if you think about the sunset it's not just the sun that you see the whole sky turns all these different colors is sinking down meaning the sun is setting in its tranquility it, this is a reference to this calm mood again the, the use of word of the word tranquility the enjambment of these lines the run on lines um, emphasizes the process of the sun setting the gentleness of heaven broods over the sea gentleness once again this diction keeps highlighting the peaceful mood of heaven if you think of heaven you always associate heaven with god so it's a reference to god yeah broods you can think of broods as like lingers or contemplates over the sea so it's almost like you know god or heaven is hovering over the sea and we're going to see later on that he's talking about the motion maker talking about the waves and it's once again you can sort of see god's presence in the movement of the waves over the sea the sea is also the setting gives us an indication that this is the seaside walk that he is experiencing with his daughter listen now we have a command that shatters the calmness and why does he shatter the calmness he does it with this impassioned tone as you can see from the exclamation mark in order to alert and ensure that his companion is aware of the beauty of nature and the beauty of god the mighty being is awake so mighty being we can see this as maybe literally being the sea which is controlled by god but the fact that it's um it's capitalized that being is capitalized indicates that he's talking actually about god is awake and what he's saying about you know god is awake is his meaning that it's visible god is visible in nature spirituality can be seen in the natural world and doth with his eternal motion make so eternal and then the next line we have everlastingly emphasizing that nature and god are everlasting motion make here we have the alliteration this is the sea's waves and the sea's waves are never going to stop and then the alliteration mimics the continual rash of the waves and the waves as we said earlier sort of signify god's presence make his presence known a sound like thunder everlastingly a sound like thunder here we have a simile which emphasizes the powerful sound of the waves the dash is used for elaboration but also for emphasis because it's going to emphasize that final word of the octave which is everlastingly which is a synonym for eternally the calm and tranquil night as well as the harsh sounds of the ocean both aspects of nature are to be revered and both invoke god so whether it's the quietness or whether it's the sound whatever he sees in nature he's thinking of god he's associating it with some sense of spirituality dear child dear girl that walkest with me here if thou appear untouched by solemn thought thy nature is not therefore less divine thou liest in abraham's bosom all the year and worships at the temple's inner shrine god being with me when we know it not so now we have a volta we have the shift the turn in the poem because this is a sonnet and he's going to say dear and he repeats dear dear's connotations of adoration which makes sense then if he's talking about his daughter um the exclamation marks really emphasize that impassioned tone so he says um he's talking to this girl or to his daughter that's walking with him um so as i said it could be a reference to his daughter and the walk they took together or otherwise it could just be a child that he is referring to if thou appear untouched by solemn thought appear you think of like appearance versus reality it's not necessarily true it's not necessarily reality she but she appears it looks like she's untouched sort of uninspired or unaware by solemn thought what's the solemn thought the solemn thought is the serious and deep reflections the speaker has about the relationship between nature and god that's referred to in the octave she doesn't look to be affected by the signs of god and beauty in nature in front of them but that doesn't mean she doesn't see it and appreciate it she just doesn't seem 
overtly apparent. Thy nature is not therefore less divine. He says, your nature is not um, less spiritual. This does not make you less spiritual. It does not make you less divine. It sort of means godly in this context. Thou liest Abraham's bosom all the year. He says, you lie in Abraham's bosom. Abraham, allusion to the Bible, a reference to the Bible. So we think of Abraham as a forefather and a messenger of God. And so what he's talking about here is he's talking about how the child is protected by God. We get that impression because it sa he says the child is lying in Abraham's bosom like his chest, which is sort of like how you'd protect a child. You'd hold him against your chest. Um, and so the child is actually, what he's going to argue here, is that even though the child doesn't seem to be affected by all these godly images and natural beauty that she's seeing, she is actually nearer to God and godliness. Than the speaker actually is all the year meaning always and worshiped at the temple's inner shrine so here she's he's saying that she actually worships at the temple's inner shrine a shrine is like the holiest place and he says the holiest place where this holiest temple or place to worship where this girl actually prays is within nature itself it's not necessarily within a building she worships nature while being in nature God being with thee when we know it not. It's the sense of you don't have to actually even go to a temple to pray, but it's all around you in the nature. And you can feel that you don't even have to, like this girl doesn't even appear to be appreciating it, but she is. And that's her, her sort of form of worship. God is always with you, even if you're not aware of it. Notice how in this line, it's actually the first mention of God, but the connection of the link between God and nature has been hinted at throughout the poem. But this is the first time that he is overtly said the word God in the last line to push, pull, pull everything together. And ultimately, that last line is the message of the poem. It's about nature. It's about um, spirituality coming together and how we are impacted by it, whether we know it or not. So for some general analysis, the structure of the poem is an Italian or Petrarchan sonnet, although the rhyme scheme is slightly different to a traditional one. We have the octave, which has the rhyme scheme A, B, B, A, A, C, C, A, which highlights the beauty of the evening and the presence of God. And then we have the sestet, which is the sixth rhyme, um, which is, you know, distinguished by that volta. And here we have the rhyme scheme D, E, F, D, F, E. And here he speaks to the child and comments on children's unique or special connection to nature. The tone of the poem is earnest, ardent, contemplative, thoughtful. There's even a sense of wonder. He is in awe. The mood is calm, serene, blissful, almost at ease. And the theme of the message, God and nature as one, is that very sort of romantic idea. And this is a romantic poem. Um, God's presence is everywhere, even when we don't recognize it. Children's innate divinity and connection to nature, God and spirituality, and also the sense of praising nature and God. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video helpful. Please remember to like the video and to subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Hello, and welcome to another Chai Tutor video. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the poem, Prayer to Mars. So firstly, a quick discussion of our poet and the context of this poem. The poet was born in 1906 and he died in 2001. He was a poet a po and a politician and he was the first president of Senegal after Senegal achieved its independence. He was an advocate for black culture and empowerment, and he believed in the importance of a shared African culture. So the context of this poem is that this poem has been written as a prayer, as we will discuss now with the title, um, but it's been written during the days towards the end of colonialism, just before Senegal achieves its independence from its European colonizers. If we have a look at the title, Prayer to Masks, the fact that it's called this gives us an understanding of the intention of the poem, that this is a prayer. Masks, we can think about this in a couple different ways. 
The masks are associated with African culture, but they represent the ancestors in this poem. And so this is this poem is a prayer. It's a um, prayer to to uh, like directed towards the ancestors, asking them for guidance. If you also think about a mask, a mask is a symbol of concealment, you know, of hiding your true identity, perhaps. And so in this way, the mask can maybe reference how Africa has not been able to be its true self during the terrible years of colonialism. But in terms of the more sort of standard approach to this title, we can understand it as the intention to pray to the ancestors. The poem is just one complete stanza, but I've split it up at different points just to make it easier to read on the screen. So please, this is not in stanzas. It is just one continuous stanza. Masks, oh masks, black mask, red mask, you black and white mask, rectangular masks through whom the spirit breathes. I greet you in silence. So the first line, masks, oh masks, the exclamation marks and the repetition emphasize the sense of sincerity and desperateness of the prayer the speaker is um, uttering. Um, and here he is addressing the marks, and so we call this figure of speech apostrophe. It's a sort of form of personification because the speaker is directly um, talking to masks, which are inanimate objects, obviously. And so the fact that he's talking to the masks, which represent the ancestors, as you know, this is called apostrophe. This is when you address an inanimate object, a non-living thing, as though it is living, as though, as though it is human. And what this does, it emphasizes the power of the mask and, sin mask and the sincerity of the speaker's prayer. Black mask, red mask, you black and white masks. Here we can see he is addressing all different kinds of masks. And this showcases the speaker's, um, the speaker's concern with inclusive African culture, about including all different people from across the continent, Africa, within this new image for what Africa will become. So he addresses all these different kinds of masks. He is trying to be inclusive. Rectangular masks, you think of a traditional African mask being in a rectangular shape, through whom the spirit breathes, the spirit meaning the ancestors. And the fact that the ancestors are breathing, this is obviously not literal because the ancestors have passed on, but it's almost like the ancestors are alive in a sense. The speaker has summoned them through prayer and also it could refer to the fact that their spirit is alive. I greet you in silence. The first person pronoun emphasizes a sense of sincerity. In silence, if you like greet someone in silence, it's usually a sign of respect. You like revere them or you respect them. So he greets these ancestors in silence. And you too, my lion head ancestor, you guard this place that is closed to any feminine laughter, to any mortal smile. You purify the air of eternity. Here where I breathe the air of my fathers, masks of maskless faces, free from dimples and wrinkles. So now he um, goes specific. So in, second, in the second line, he addressed all the different kinds of masks. And now he specifically refers to Lionhead ancestor. Um, so now he's talking to a specific ancestor. If you think about a lion, a lion represents courage and strength and boldness. But also a lion is symbolic of Senegal as itself so now as obviously he is to become the sp um, the speaker is to become the or the poet is to become the um president of senegal so obviously he is senegalese and he is um, associated with that country so he's talking to everyone in the second line all the ancestors but now he's talking specifically to like an ancestor representative of senegal who is going to um you know hear his prayer even more person personally and deeply you guard this place this place meaning the afterlife that is close to any feminine laughter. This is a symbol of maybe like being not very serious, like unseriousness. Um, it could also refer to uh, like the continuation of sort of a patriarchal system in Africa to any mortal smile. Um, this place is obviously the afterlife because it is closed to any mortal smile. If any sort of, um, it's closed off. There's no sense of unseriousness. Also mortal meaning um, like, you know, the ancestors are not mortal, they sort of live on forever, they're immortal in the afterlife. So only dead people are sort of allowed in this afterlife. The living are not included. You purify the air of eternity. So you purify, it means like this positive impact. 
that the ancestors make over over eternity over this land of the afterlife which goes on forever and ever they have this positive impact here where i breathe the air of my fathers and then he talks about here talking about africa and he's basically showing how the ancestors guide the current generation to what it is today so he breathes the air of my fathers meaning he's breathing in the same air that his that his fathers or that his ancestors once breathed but that he's walking in their footsteps almost masks of maskless faces so this is a really interesting um image masks are referring to the ancestors but maskless faces and this refers to what we said earlier about what masks can represent so this is in two ways so the masks represent the ancestors but then maskless faces means that these ancestors are not um, concealing anything they are truthful they are a truthful embodiment of the people that they once were and of the sort of like honesty and positive guidance they are not concealed they are not hiding anything free from dimples and wrinkles they are not like mortals who age and decay these ancestors have a higher power um, they are not like regular mortals you have composed this image this is my face that bends over the altar of white paper in the name of your image listen to me now while the africa of despotism is dying it is the agony of a pitiable princess like that of europe to whom she is connected through the navel now fix your immobile eyes upon your children who have been called and who sacrifice their lives like the poor man his last garment so that hereafter we may cry here at the rebirth of the world being the leaven that white flour kneads. So you have composed your image, um, meaning that the ancestors have molded the person that the speaker is. This is my face that bends over the altar of worship. So he says, if you think of the word altar, the imagery is like of worship or of, um, you know, of sacrifice, some sort of religious imagery. So he's bending over this altar of white paper. So it shows how he is asking for the guidance of the ancestors the further guidance as he stands upon this white paper the symbol of white paper it's like this blank page right and that's a key theme in this poem it's about new beginnings because as africa emerges from this period of colonialism they have a chance to redefine themselves and to create they, they have to create an entirely new government an entirely new system of how their country is going to run and so white paper is a symbol of this new beginning um, and so then this new start. So he seeks the ancestors help considering the future and what he's going to write on that future, what he's going to actually say. And you can think about him being a politician as well. Like what laws should I create? What should I be saying? What should I be communicating to? Um, you know, what is, what is a new Africa all about? In the name of your image. So here he invokes the ancestors power. Listen to me. This is a desperate plea for guidance now this is this use of now shows that he's relaying current events while the africa of despotism is dying so despotism is authoritarian and cruel governance and he says that this is dying in africa notice the alliteration of the d sound it imitates the or mimics the sound like the descent of this um authoritative and discriminatory and racist regime of the of the colonial forces and then he uses a dash to show elaboration it is the agony of a pitiable princess agony means suffering it has really negative connotations a really negative um, choice of words here of a pitiable princess if you think of pitiable princess we can understand this image in two different ways um, so firstly we can talk about pitiable princess as being europe that europe is now to be pitied because it had to give up all this territory it was spoiled like a princess was but now it's like pitiable means you 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 have pity for something and so now everyone's like oh shame poor europe because they have let go of all of they had to let go of all their of all their their territories in africa and which were giving them so much money and success but we can also see pitiable princess as africa and how africa was seen throughout apartheid because a princess meaning has a lot of riches africa is really a beautiful or is really a beautiful place with all these resources all this beauty all this um all these riches but under colonialism it was to be pitied because the colonial regime really tore it apart 
like that of Europe to whom she is connected through the navel. So now we have a really interesting image um, referring to um, the umbilical cord. So we have the imagery of a mother connected to a baby through an umbilical cord. During colonialism, the European countries were often known as the mother countries, um, but this is almost used ironically because when a mother and baby are connected, this is obviously a relationship that is has positive connotations, right? And the umbilical cord represents, um, you know, nurturing and nourishment. It's a life-giving force to the baby. But in this instance, in this re reference to the image, um, actually Africa needs to, you know, sever this relationship. They need to um, be cut off from the mother in order to gain their independence and um, actually have a positive relationship with Europe. They actually have to sever that, that tie to them. Um, and that speaks about, you know, this, there's new beginnings and the idea that Africa is going to have to function and have relations with Europe, but it mustn't be in the same way that colonialism, that the period of colonialism was. Now fix your immobile eyes upon your children who have been called. So now, once again, we're in current events and he's asking the ancestors to actually fix their immobile eyes. Immobile eyes refers literally to the sense of their mouth and their eyes can't move. But it can also refer to, um, it also can also refer to the ancestors, their immobile eyes, like they are always going to be dedicated and focused on Africa and how they can help Africa. They're always going to be dedicated to the African cause. And so he says, fix your eyes upon your children. So fix your focus, your children, your, this is, this emphasizes that the ancestors have a personal investment. This is their own children. This use of this pronoun, the pronouns in this poem are really important who have been called. If you think of called, it means they're like they've been summoned or they've been called up to fight for their country, for their freedom, for their future. And who sacrificed their lives, like the poor man, his last garment. This is such a powerful simile. So he's talking about they are sacrificing their lives. It's showing, emphasizing these, um, this, the, these men, and these, this youth, um, these people, um, their bravery, their commitment, uh, their commitment to the fighting and to free Africa. And they sacrifice absolutely everything, just like a poor man would sacrifice his last garment. That simile shows that a poor man, it's his very last item. It's like he's absolutely given everything. And this shows the dedication of these people to the cause. They will give everything. There's no question of their sacrifice or their dedication. So that hereafter, meaning after that we have driven the colonial forces out, we, this use of the pronouns, an inclusive pronoun, it shows a sense of unity. We may cry here, here meaning Africa. So remember the importance of place, that the colonials took away that sense of home or that sense of place for African people. At the rebirth of the world, so rebirth of the world, it's like the entire world order has now changed now that Africa is going to become free. Or you can even think of like world just being Africa, like the whole continent of Africa, such a big place, it feels like the rebirth of the entire world. Then you've been leaven. Leaven is a rising agent that the white flour needs. So think of like the imagery of baking bread. In order for the um, bread to rise, it needs a rising agent. And so here we have this contrast of the that the that Africa is almost like the leaven that has allowed the white flour to rise, that allowed Europe to prosper. So Europe was only successful because of Africa's role in its development. And it actually needed Africa in the past to be successful and it's going to continue to need Africa to be successful. So it really places the power on Africa. For who else would teach rhythm to the world that has died of machines and cannons? For who else should ejaculate the cry of joy that arouses the dead and the wise in a new dawn? Say, who else could return the memory of life to men with the torn hope? So here the anaphora of four and four and the repeated use of the rhetorical question just emphasizes a sense of sincerity. And so he says, for who else would teach the rhythm? Rhythm is associated with music, which is associated with Africa, but it's also sort of associated with joy. He says, who is going to teach rhythm? Who's going to teach the sense of joy to a world that has died? And the use of world again just emphasizes how many people have suffered of machines and cannons. Machines and cannons, imagery of warfare. So he says, who else is going to be inspirational? Who else is going to um, teach that there is a, a life after all these atrocities? For who else should ejaculate the cry of joy? 
Who else is going to shout and cry with joy that arouses the dead that has such an impact and the wise and a new dawn that shows people a new dawn, a new beginning? The rhetorical questions are used here because the answers are obvious. These are the African youth who are going to inspire, who are going to be able to pull Africa out of this um, this period of suffering and into this new dawn, into this new beginning. This, these two lines emphasize how Africans are incredibly strong, in particular the youth are incredibly strong. Only they can undo so much pain and emerge optimistic from the future. Say, who else could return the memory of life to men with torn hope? This like say is a really conversational tone. Um, here, another rhetorical question. He says the youth is going to inspire the older generation to heal and recover. They call us cotton heads and coffee men and oily men. They call us men of death, but we are the men of the dance whose feet only gain power when they reach the hard soil. So they, here's the use of the exclusive pronoun indicating the colonialists um, and what they call them is they call them cotton heads and coffee men. Cotton and coffee, these were main cash crops that the colonialists forced um, their colonies to grow in order to um, you know, make the Europeans a lot of money. And the reference to them as coffee heads, coffee men, sorry, cotton heads, coffee men and oily men shows how the Europeans dehumanized African people because they only knew them for what they produced and what offer or what benefit they could offer them. They call us men of death. Notice the they versus the us. It shows this distinction. And these men of death, why would they call them men of death? They don't see the hope and the sense of rebirth that these men are going to yield um, for the better of their country and for the better of their future. But this is the change. This is um, basically the speaker saying that the colonialist perception of them is completely wrong. It's inaccurate. We are the men of the dance. Dance has positive connotations of celebration, whose feet only gain power when they beat the hard soil. There's a tone of pride in this last line. They gain power and strength from their identity and from their place in Africa. The hard soil referring to referring to well soil Africa and hard maybe the difficult times. They gain further power by dancing and rebuilding optimistically. So in the face of all the suffering, this is how they gain even more power by being optimistic, by rebuilding. The structure of this poem is just one stanza. It's in three verbs. There's lots of exclamation marks and question marks. It's really sincere and it links with that idea from the title that it's a prayer. The tone and the mood. At different times, we have different tones and moods. So we have sincere, authentic, pleading at times, passionate or impassioned, assertive, optimistic, and at times respectful. The theme and the message is about oppression, colonialism, honoring the ancestors or traditional cultural practices, desire for freedom, optimism, new beginnings, and power of Africa and Africans. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found that video helpful. Please remember to like the video and to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video.